Okay, cool. Attendance is going around one for Sarah and one for us. Just to make sure. Yes. And I see some of you guys have name cards. If you have it with you, please put it out. Makes makes it easier instead of saying hey you. Yeah. Okay. Hey you and then. And let's make sure. Color. Let's raise hands today, guys. Yes. And I also, um, if anybody likes candy, I did bring candy to try and encourage you guys to talk a little bit. That so helps. They got no problem. <laughs> I can answer the first question. Okay. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> spending an hour and a half in a phone call with Verizon customer tech support services. That sounds good. Can you imagine being oh. Sunday and doing that? That sounds about right. I can't even go to <laughs> go to settings your toolbox under <laughs> Okay. So today I have invited Sarah from the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, they are a resource that we use at our agency um, to better serve clients. They are kind of the professionals at it as you would say, and we ask them for technical help and things like that, as long as also they do help manage some of our grant funding. Um, Sarah um, has come here to talk about elder abuse, and uh, then later on in the class we're going to be talking about traumatic brain injuries, which sometimes uh, victims of domestic violence and sexual violence suffer from, and you have to approach services differently. Um, so it's good to learn. So I'll let her take it away. Um, is that cool? Yes. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good. Good. Okay. So um, as Andrea said, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm with the Nevada Coalition. Um, we're located in Reno. Um, so I do have uh, some information here for you today on elder abuse, um, abuse in later life, and traumatic brain injury, which we'll go over in the second half of the class. Um, you have all of the notes in front of you, um, so feel free to follow along, ask questions. I love questions, I love discussion. There will be some opportunities for us to raise our hand and talk to each other about what we're discussing, um, things like that, and like I said, I have candy, so if you like candy, feel free to ask for it. Um, okay. Or answer a question. Or answer a question, yes. Um, so I will give out a second um, handout when we get to traumatic brain injury towards the second half of the class. Um, some of the other handouts that I have up here, I have a quick evaluation that I'll give you at the end of this presentation just so you can let me know how I did, how this information is helpful to you. Um, some of the other things, I've got pamphlets up here on abuse in later life, intimate partner violence in later life, English and Spanish. Feel free to take some. And then my business cards are up here as well. So during the breaks, you guys can come up and grab some. Um, so just to go over really fast what's in our packets. Um, so you have the presentation in here so you can follow along. The next thing that you'll find in here, we have the power and control wheel for abuse in later life. We'll also go over this and what this means. Um, we have a, a national resource directory for abuse in la later life, so some more national technical assistance resources that we use often if you want to reference them later. Um, there is a quick fact sheet on domestic violence, primarily in um, female, older adults. And then the last thing that you'll see in here is on safety planning. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about safety planning too, as I'm sure you guys have. You guys talked about safety planning. A little bit. Okay. So um, with safety planning, you know, we know that it's different for um, every survivor, and that it's kind of an evolving thing. So we'll talk a little bit what about what safety planning looks like in older adults. Any questions before we get started? Okay, so um, to get us started, I kind of just want to go around and get a feel for who is in this room. So um, we'll go around, tell me, um, I can see your name, but tell me your name. Um, and tell me um, something you know about elder abuse or um, something that you're wanting to learn from this presentation. So we'll start over here. Uh, my name is Danny. Um, only thing I'm really familiar with like elder abuse is like when caretakers abuse the elderly. Okay. I'm Jessica. I really haven't, I don't know much at all. Okay. Is there anything you're interested in learning today? Um, like how prevalent I guess it is in, uh, in like homes and stuff. Okay. Uh, my name's Greta and I don't know too much about elder abuse. Um, 
Except my grandmother uh, had an experience in the hospital near the end of her life where they were doing um, mammograms on the elderly that were um, kind of a quota and not really <laughs> not really necessary for someone in the late stages of life. And so sometimes it's, you know, within the hospital's system that that you can be abused. Um, I guess I would be interested in learning the facilities that are having issues with this and where they're located. Okay, thanks for sharing. My name is Jessica and uh, same. I don't have a lot of experience or knowledge about this. Um, I'm very interested to hear everything you have to present us. Yeah? <laughs> All right, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Mariah, and I guess one thing that I know about elder abuse is that um, it's more frequent among people who don't have family or whose family rarely visit. My name's Dara. Um, I would say the only thing that I know about elderly abuse, I would think financial abuse is probably a really big component. Um, and I'm interested in learning about the different resources that are available. Perfect. I'm Kristen. Um, I know that it's pretty prevalent in the assisted living homes and it gets difficult um, because, you know, elder, elderly people have more um, like dementia and Alzheimer's and stuff, so it's hard to a lot of the times people don't believe them or, you know, things like that. So the mental health comes in, um, yeah. I'm elderly, so I'm just interested in learning more about it. Yeah. Right. Uh, my name's Joe, and I was... <laughs> and uh, professionally, I was involved in the medical rehabilitation industry, including subacute and acute rehab, and so we did a lot of work in skilled nursing facilities and intermediate care facilities as well as assisted living facilities. But the big thing is given the aging and given the fact that we're able to keep people alive so much longer, it's allowing the uh, diagnosis of dementia and Alzheimer's one to be far more prevalent. I think it's probably really underreported uh, from my experience in hospitals and whatnot. Uh, I think a lot of people lose a lot of patience with the elderly and then that can often translate into abuse. Yeah. Thank you. My name's Bonnie, and yes, 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 <laughs> about assisted living and all that. But um, even for families that take on caring for their parents as they age, um, it can be frustrating and difficult. I've seen that, and there can it can result in abuse, right? Where they just they get so uptight and disgusted or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So it happens in families, right? Um, my name is Tanya, and I would like to know if it's more like prevalent amongst like women or men and what the difference between that looks like. Okay. And my name is Janet, and I'm just interested in learning more about the finding out what resources you have out there um, to get them out to the community. My name is Reina Babila, and I'm interested in learning more about, about your presentation. Perfect, okay, so it sounds like um, some of us have kind of seen some of this stuff firsthand or been exposed to it. Um, and pretty much all the questions that you guys have will be stuff that's covered in this presentation. So again, ask questions if you have them. Um, here's our acknowledgement to our lovely grant um, prepared by Judy. So this presentation was put together by Judy Henderson, our training coordinator, um, and it will be presented by yours truly. Again, my name is Sarah. Um, there's my contact information. It's also in your presentations that you have in front of you. Okay, so um, I kind of like to start with this quote among our greatest challenges as a nation today is making America a safe place to grow old. Um, obviously, that's something that we all want, right? A safety kind of throughout the lifespan, not just as um, a young or a middle adult, but also um, an older adult. So I won't read through all of these word for word, but these are just some of our objectives, some of the things that we'll cover in today's presentation, so you can look over these. <coughs> So ageism, we will um, start by covering ageism. So um, who can give me an example of ageism? It's kind of institutionalized. We see it a lot and might not realize it. Um, when you 
Like say someone older applies for a job and they don't get the job because they're older. Okay. Yeah, that can be an example. Anybody else have an example? Yeah. Statements like uh, you know, <clears throat> being in a tech driven career base now. Well, they're older, so they're not very technologically minded. They definitely won't fit in. Right. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Yeah. Um, so basically prejudice, stereotyping, and discrimination based on somebody's age. Um, and this isn't necessarily just for older adults. This can be against um, somebody of any age. Um, America, we do have an ageist society. So again, this is kind of something that's systematic. It's institutionalized. Um, some examples in how ageism might be expressed. Um, I always think of like elder speak. So when we talk to older adults, we might say, hi, honey, how are you doing today? Or um, uh, is there any- Gramps or pops? Yeah. Is it like just talking to an to his age? Exactly, yeah. And um, you know, kind of using this patronizing language to them, these tones, um, maybe speaking very loudly because you assume that they can't hear you. They, you assume that because they're older that they are hard of hearing, which isn't always true as we know. Um, so all these examples of ageism are very prevalent. We see them a lot and sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it when we're talking to older adults. Um, and ageism is a big part of um, abuse in later life as well. It's kind of rooted in the <coughs> foundation of ageism. So setting the context to silver tsunami, does anybody know what we're talking about when we mean the silver tsunami? Just like all the baby members getting older? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. It's also referred to as age wave. Yeah, uh huh. So it's kind of our, our aging population, and we're aging extremely rapidly here in the United States. So starting in 2011, 10,000 Americans will turn 65 every day and ongoing for the next 20 years. So again, that baby booming generation. Um, one in about every three women in America is 50 years of age or older. Um, about almost 14% of all Americans have a disability and that um, isn't necessarily a physical disability. It might also be intellectual or cognitive disability. <clears throat> and the fastest growing population again is um, our population that's 85 or older and we'll go a little bit more into what defines an older adult. So who are the elderly, elderly? I think this one is kind of an interesting one to look into, kind of put it into some context as to um, their age and the kinds of things that they've seen. Um, so if a person is turning 80 this year, they were born in 1938. Um, FDR was our president. Germany began the persecution of Jews that year. Um, the radio adaptation of War of the Worlds, does everybody know of that, the War of the Worlds? Maybe. So it was, um, it was a, a novel, I think H.G. Wells is the author of it, um, but it was kind of broadcasted over the radio and it was, exactly, yeah, and it was done so well and so seriously that people were listening to it and they thought this was actually happening. Yeah, so they kind of freaked out and it's about an alien invasion, um, if you didn't know, so you can imagine how terrifying that is. they ended up making a movie on it too. They did, yeah. yeah. Um, Adolf Hitler is Time Magazine's Man of the Year, which is, Kind of interesting to think about. Um, also important to consider that at this point in time, um, the man of the year was kind of um, the most influential person that year. It doesn't necessarily mean they're the best person that year. Um, oils discovered in, which we know was not true. Oils discovered in Saudi Arabia and ballpoint pens were introduced to the public that year. Um, gas costs 10 cents a gallon. A new car was almost $800 and brick was nine cents a loaf. Minimum wage was 25 cents an hour for a 44 hour work week. And the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, later named the March of Dimes, was founded that year. So just to kind of put it into context, um, right. those that um, are getting a little bit older, the kinds of things that they've seen. So again, what have they lived through are Jim Crow laws, depression, the Tuskegee medical experiments, um, Pearl Harbor, Japanese internment camps, the Holocaust, assassinations of JFK, MLK, RFK, and Malcolm X, um, immigration, the farm worker movement. So we can kind of start thinking about how experiencing all of these huge historical events can kind of start shaping your mentality as you get older. And we'll talk more about what this can do to a person mentally. So in Nevada senior population, we had a couple of you guys talk about how you were kind of interested um, in the prevalence of uh, abuse in later life, especially here in Nevada. Um, are you guys from Nevada? Or are you guys more from California? We have a couple stuff on California here, but um, so the 65 and older population is expected to grow 264 percent from 2000 to 2030. Um, so this is from the census in 2012. Um, age is 50 and up is 31 percent of Nevada's population. 
65 and up is 12% of Nevada's population, and 85, per, 85 and up is 1% of Nevada's population. Um, and Nevada has the highest percentage increase in senior population um, in, the entire, in the entire nation at about 57%. So we're definitely aging very rapidly, and especially in a lot of our rural areas in Nevada is where we have a lot of our older adults. So what is abuse in later life? What does it look like? We'll start defining it before we get into um, the kinds of signs that we see and how to serve them. So I won't read through these exactly, but I do have um, the definitions here as defined by Nevada law and then as defined by the California Penal Code. So one thing that is important to note in the difference is that Nevada classifies an older adult as anybody who is 60 or older, whereas California classifies an older adult as anybody who's 65 or older. So there's a little bit of a difference there too, and that's important <coughs> when it comes to reporting. Um, mandatory reporting for older adults, it kind of depends on their age. Okay, so um, older adults are at a greater risk for mortality, about 300% higher. So this is especially important for those who are suffering from um, physical abuse. So um, hitting, beating, slapping, punching, anything like that, they're three times more likely to die from that physical abuse as a result of that abuse. Um, higher rates for elders with uh, dementia, other mental disabilities, any sort of chronic disease. Um, limited or diminished cognitive capacity can cause a temporary condition um, and we'll also talk a little bit more about this when we get to traumatic brain injury which can be um, uh, mild or severe depending on what kind of trauma it is um, and it is important to work with healthcare providers to meet the survivor needs and sometimes it's a little bit um, beyond our scope as advocates and sometimes it does require medical attention so who is affected by abuse in later life um, unfortunately or uh, it, it doesn't discriminate against anybody. Anybody can be a victim of abuse in later life. Um, gender, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status. Anybody can be a perpetrator or a victim of abuse. Um, people in good health or people with a disability. So um, older adults or people with disabilities can be more um, likely to experience abuse in their relationships. Um, but you know, people that are in perfectly good health or younger adults are just as likely. Who abuses? So as a couple of us said in this room, um, the majority of abusers for older adults are their family members or their caregivers, and sometimes those people are the same. 50% um, of their adult offspring, 30% are over 60 years of age, so that um, especially becomes true for these much older adults who start to get into the 85 and older range. Um, and 20% are spouses and partners. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what um, partner abuse looks like in this, um, in this population, but for the most part, a lot of times it's their family members. Um, and it can also be partners in LGBT plus relationships, caregivers, persons in positions of authority, so that can be their guardians. Um, it can be somebody serving them in a financial institution, maybe their bank teller because they have access to um, their finances. Um, lawyers, interpreters, pretty much anybody who has some sort of authority or a position of power um, over this older adult. So these are some common abuser justifications. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit easier for an abuser to justify their behavior over an older adult um, because of that ageism that we see a lot. We think like, oh, you know, maybe they don't remember a lot or they, they fall a lot or, um, you know, they're just imagining that that happened, things like that. Um, they're just clumsy, so if they see a bruise on them or something, they just fell and they're like, oh yeah, you know, they're old, it happens. Um, they didn't do as I wanted. They started it, so that mutual abuse, I, they were fighting me, so I fought back. Um, very demanding, and they're just too difficult to care for, so it can um, come from caregiver stress, which can get harder as the person starts to get older. I have a problem with my temper, blaming it on their uh, mental capacity. I was drunk or high, I'm sick, it's not my fault. Um, in my culture, elders share their resources and we don't put elders in a facility. That's a really, really big one. Um, so they can keep them near them, whether it be for any sort of physical, mental abuse, especially financial abuse. Um, I was hit when I was a child, so you know this is the only thing I know, um, so I'm gonna you know, inflict it on other people. They told me they didn't wanna go to the doctor, I was following their wishes. So this is um, also commonly seen in maybe older adults who can't speak for themselves. So those who are caring for them just kind of speak on their behalf. Oh, they told me they didn't want to go to the doctor, so I didn't take them, and then they don't know any better. You know what I find interesting about like a couple slides before is that yeah. you know it, you think of, when you think about like at, like home, like um, care of life when you get older and getting into these 
these facilities, mm -hmm. but it, it's set in, that might, might be where the abuse happens because there's some disconnect, but it says mm -hmm. that adult offspring were, what, 50% yeah. of the perpetrators, so it's just, it's, it's bizarre. Right, that somebody that close to them. Yeah, could do something like that. Well, you exactly. think it's kind of like sexual assault. You think it's a stranger, but it's really somebody you know. Right. And here you think it's a stranger, and it's more than often something you know that's also doing it. Yeah, and I, yeah. And I think that um, a lot of times that that um, comes from the close relationship that they have. So um, maybe the uh, victim, the person that's experiencing the abuse, they might not see it as abuse because it's their child. So um, their child is constantly asking them for money, um, constantly, you know, leaving them at home, or they're mean to them, or something like that, and they're like, "Oh, it's just my child. I'm used to it," you know. So that relationship can kind of um, be a huge barrier as well to them leaving or to the child leaving because they think, "Oh, it's my parent. I can take advantage of them," you know. Mm -hmm. If I can add, I think somebody yeah. else that needs to be focused on the autism when it relates to the abuse is actually the medical system, the physicians themselves. Mm -hmm. because they often over prescribe and they often prescribe too many different drugs right. that they don't understand. They're getting better in terms of the pharmacology of it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, an example, my grandmother, when we finally took her out of the situation she was in, she was on 17 different medications. Mm -hmm. It took us six months to wean her down to one. She only needed to get one. Right. But what happens is the patient doesn't know. The physicians get frustrated with their inpatient or whatever. Just give them a new med. Just right. give them your bed. And that, that is, yeah. and that and also in the nursing home <coughs> extended care facilities, uh, they often aren't really getting the patients themselves engaged in the type of activities of daily living where they can actually feel more human. Mm -hmm. So in essence it becomes like a warehouse. Exactly. And that really shouldn't be the case. And so to me it's a, it's a right. pretty big societal issue mm -hmm. um, that needs to be focused on. Yeah, I I'll give you a piece of candy for that. That was great. I feel like it's awesome for guys. Is it got chocolate? It is chocolate. I'm going to give you like three bits of tears. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's absolutely true. The healthcare system in general is um, a huge part of any sort of abuse, either because of reasons like that, they just kind of send them out and they don't see them very often because they think the medication is going to hold them over. Um, other times, the screening and intake process is. You know, they either ask a quick question and then they take no as an answer, or they just don't ask at all because it's not their business. You know, they don't want to open Pandora's box, any of those things. So, um, and again, especially because of those things that we talked about with ageism and um, things that make people kind of more prone um, to being abused, whether it be their cognitive capacity or um, their abilities or disabilities, anything like that, it kind of makes them easier to just kind of send away. And in addition, it makes more sense, it's a big societal and a cultural issue because yeah. in a lot of other countries, they've got a much healthier way of dealing with the elderly and the aging as mm -hmm. it relates to the institutionalization process right. and even the reimbursement of the thing. So the problem is with Medicaid, not providing enough resources, often even Medicare, which is much better than Medicaid, mm -hmm. then you don't have enough people that need to focus the type of services on the people that need it, and they're not being paid to do it. Right. And so it creates a, a real a double bond. So really it's something that culturally we need to look at, which is where should resources flow? So right up there with education, mm -hmm. there needs to be something in terms of being able to help people maintain their health and be healthier in the situation they're in. Right. My experience was there just wasn't enough resources and it was very frustrating for the caregivers too. Right. And just a comment on something you said, we actually have, when we do our trainings for healthcare providers, one of the things that we let them know is you actually can get reimbursed for the time that you spent screening um, on intimate partner violence. So we give them all of their ICP codes and everything that they need so that they can get reimbursed by Medicare, Medicaid, any of those things. So. Yeah, that's great. Did you have something? Yeah, I was just going off of the hospital system. I mean, think like uh, what Joe was saying. Um, they also don't, they're the elderly, so they don't always come first in what's going on in the hospital. Right. So a lot of that attention, like even like when an elderly person gets the flu versus when a kid gets or a child or a baby gets the flu, mm -hmm. a baby takes precedent. And it's, it's just kind of the way it goes. Right. That kind of organization of priority yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. <laughs>
Are you guys and seeing a pattern here? You're talking about candy. And the, and the truth is, too, <laughs> how many people have, have cared for, like I cared for his grandma mm -hmm. when she was 91. Yeah. <coughs> and um, <laughs> it ain't easy. Right, it's not. You know, I mean, yeah. a lot of them are, you know, pretty heavy. You gotta like pick them up and put them in the tub and, you know, they have diarrhea. And exactly. I mean, it's more work than a baby. Mm -hmm. Way more work. Right. And they get really super cranky mm -hmm. and they don't know what they're doing. Right. So you, ha you have to be sort of saintly. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. And what's you know. also interesting is a lot of people fall into that position because they can't afford to put somebody in a facility with full-time yeah. care. Exactly. It is so expensive to do that. Yeah. Both of my grandparents had Alzheimer's. To find somebody, a place that would take them in and to treat them properly was like so bizarre that my mom finally was like, I, I have to do it. You know, right. like it's just a lot, a lot of money and not a lot of people have that money if they've used it on other resources throughout their life, mm -hmm. or even if they saved or whatnot, or their children have it, it takes up a lot to put somebody in facility. So that's why they go into the adult offspring care. Exactly. Yeah, these are great examples of um, justification tactics, places where power comes into um, comes into play. Um, so IPV and elder abuse, they are crimes. Um, as we saw on the last slide with a couple of our examples of justification, um, they. They blame their victims, make excuses for their behavior, they deny any sort of wrongdoing, and again, it's just kind of rooted in our society that you believe the abuser oftentimes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and their behavior cannot be justified. So um, this is kind of just a little um, bit on um, consequences for elder abuse. So persons convicted of elder abuse may serve up to 20 years in prison in Nevada and California if a felony up to four years in state prison. It's a big difference. Yeah. Okay. It is a big difference, yeah. Um, so how common is abuse in later life? Um, so just some quick statistics for you guys. Over 1 in 10 women over the age of 50 in the United States suffers from physical, sexual, or verbal abuse perpetrated by a significant other. That's just by a significant other. That doesn't necessarily um, include their family members or their caregivers. Um, and this abuse of elderly women by their spouses is rapidly increasing. Um, and they suffer a higher percentage of all different forms of abuse than we do, especially financial abuse, which we'll talk about later. Um, more than 60,000 rapes of women older than 50 years of age are reported <coughs> annually. Those are only the ones that are reported. Um, and, you know, as advocates, we kind of know how reporting works, so this number is likely much, much higher than this. Um, the rates are higher in racial or ethnic minority groups, um, as well as uh, the LGBT community. Um, and rates of financial exploitation are also increasing due to the economic downturn. Um, so have we all kind of seen this iceberg image before in some capacity referring to something? Um, so this is a pretty good indicator of what reporting of elder abuse looks like. So this part up here, this is the amount that we see reported. So um, this is, for example, those 60,000 annual rapes that we see of women 50 or older in the United States. This is everything that's unreported, which is more than double that. Um, so, you know, the scope of the problem, this is only what we have, but it probably, you know, doesn't even come close to what it actually is. <clears throat> and um, kind of as we were talking about before with um, the system, the healthcare system, nursing homes, anything like that, reported cases can slip through the cracks due to lack of coordination among service providers. So maybe they don't screen, um, they kind of brush it off and say, oh, it's nothing. You know, they victim blame, stuff like that. If they really didn't like it, they would just leave, things like that. So all of these things can lead to it not being reported. Yeah. I saw that on one of your other slides that was talking about elderly or vulnerable. And so it's like people who are end of life right are all in this boat like yeah cancer all that stuff exactly yeah and um, I'm glad you brought that up yeah so um, a lot of this stuff applies to not only older adults but our vulnerable adults and when the when we say vulnerable adults it's um, mostly people with a disability people with some sort of a um, mental or cognitive disorder um, or just people who are at end of life or rely on the care of somebody else um, you know to get through their daily lives thank you for bringing that up <laughs> I'll start throwing at some point, but I'm not good at throwing. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Nobody's good at catching. I'll just walk around. Okay, so types of abuse in later life. Um, 
So these are some of the types that we see. We'll talk a little bit more about them in the power and control wheel, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, so intimate partner violence, when we say intimate partner violence, again, we're usually referring to partners, spouses, some sort of romantic relationship, um, not necessarily sexual. Um, physical, psychological or emotional, non-consensual sexual conduct, any sort of sexual assault, financial exploitation or stalking. Um, stalking, have you guys covered stalking? Okay, yeah, so stalking, again, is one of those things that we see pretty often that sometimes doesn't really get grouped under this umbrella as abuse. Um, other forms of elder abuse, isolation, exploitation of any sort, neglect, self-neglect, or abuse um, by a caretaker, which isn't necessarily a romantic partner. What self-neglect mean? Why? How about elder abuse, like abuse? Um, so self-neglect can often come from um, the neglect of somebody else. So um, maybe they um, are not being taken care of or by some sort of emotional abuse that kind of lowers their self-esteem. So from that point, they might start to believe that they don't deserve to be taken care of. Um, they don't deserve to have um, you know, good personal hygiene, things like that. So at that point, they kind of start neglecting themselves and their own health. Yeah. All right, so this power and control wheel, this is what you guys have in your packet. So this um, was developed in uh, Duluth, Minnesota by the Domestic Violence Intervention Project. So the reason this was um, developed, originally there was the plain power and control wheel for romantic relationships, and um, they sat in um, interviews and conversations with survivors of different, different types of violence, and we're talking to them about the abusive behaviors that they were experiencing. Um, and they kind of started noting these behaviors in a wheel, and the reason that they are shaped in a wheel is to emphasize the fact that power and control is a systematic process. Um, it's not, you know, one behavior, it's not one thing that they do to you, it's just kind of, um, you know, an ever-going process. It just continues over and over and over again. And you can see multiple things, multiple types of abuse. Um, and so this one was developed specifically for elders um, because they saw that you know, the normal power and control wheel for intimate relationships wasn't necessarily all encompassing of the types of abuse that older adults see. Um, so in here we see uh, physical abuse, threats and intimidation, abusing dependencies or neglecting, using privilege, family members, isolation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is something that we can refer to a lot. I keep one of these by my desk. Um, and I just look at it all the time and it's kind of a quick resource guide to kind of look at different behaviors um, of violence of any sort of population. And they have one of these for pretty much everybody. There's one for teens, there's one for normal romantic relationships, elders, LGBT, so, um, and they're all personalized to that population. Yeah, we've seen them what was that? We've been seeing these, right? Yeah, we had a, we, all, we discussed yeah. that like an LGBT. One. Okay. And obviously the IPV one. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure this is not your first time seeing it, and it definitely won't be your last. <laughs> okay, so um, some of the examples of um, abuse that we will see um, slaps, hits, punches, and kicks, pushes, shoves, burns, bites, pinches, pulling their hair, um, twisting their limbs, unexplained bruises or lacerations from you know various weapons or um, household items. Strangle, smothering with pillow. One of the things that we see a lot with strangling, um, do you guys know what petechiae is? Have you seen petechiae? So it's kind of, um, for those of you who don't, it's like the red spots that you get around your cheeks or in your eyes. Um, sometimes you get them like when you're throwing up a lot and stuff. This often shows up in victims of strangulation. Um, that's something that you might see a lot if you don't see anything around their neck. Sometimes you see it on their face. Um, and then throwing things. So I don't know how well we can see these two pictures. Um, how do you spell that? Oh, yeah. that's a great question. P E T. You have to wait till the same nurse comes in. Show us. <laughs> no, I got this. I got this. Okay. P E T E C H I A E. Yes. Yes. Cool. No, you're good. I've seen that word so many times. I should know how to spell it. Um. So yeah, these are just some examples of what this might look like. Um. In. Um. Some victims of phys physical abuse, we often see things on like their forearms. Um, might be from you know shielding their face, covering their face, so that's a pretty good indicator. Um, these are uh, lacerations around their neck from being strangled or choked or something like that. Um, so these are some that might be specific to older adults or um, vulnerable persons. So breaking their bones, purposely creating hazards in the house because you know that they can't get around very well. Um, they bump them, they trip them, use force to threaten or they physically injure them. Um, force feeding them, 
Um, medication abuse, this is a really, really common one with older adults that they rely on their caregivers to make sure that they get their medication. Um, so sometimes over-medicating them, under-medicating them, withholding their medication from them altogether. Um, inappropriate physical or chemical restraint, um, takes or moves their walker, their wheelchair, glasses, dentures, anything like that. So these things that they need to, um, you know, function on a daily basis, they just keep them from them altogether. Um, does somebody want to read this for me? There's chocolate in it for you. There you go. <laughs> chocolate. Consequences of physical abuse. Society has always imposed on men that we are supposed to be able to, to defend ourselves and if physically tackled, we are supposed to be able to punch them back. I can't punch them back. It's very emasculating to tell somebody I was abused by this person. Disabled men have a tendency to just swallow it and stay silent. Male consumer of personal assistance. Beautifully done. Thank you. Um, so, uh, what do you guys think about this? How does what comes to your mind when you read this? Yeah. The, what comes to my mind is when people attack homeless people, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. and how they are super vulnerable and a lot of times elderly, and um, there's like a trend where these teenage boys were out attacking and, and like taping them up or doing stuff to them when they're sleeping and um, they don't really defend themselves which right. is kind of surprise you know it they just are so floored maybe surprised but also I think this meant you know this feeling might might be right yeah they're already in a very vulnerable position and they kind of yeah. you know don't want to break themselves down anymore, so they just kind of let it go. That's a great example. Anybody else? Yeah. When he says it's emasculating to tell somebody that you're abused, if you are older and you've grown up in that society, you're supposed to be able to take care of yourself, be the man man. Mm -hmm. So that tells me that there's plenty of males who may not speak up out of, you know, shame. Exactly. Like, they're not going to say it. Right. Yeah, and this is definitely a societal thing. You know, because we, and this is, you know, not just with older adults or vulnerable, vulnerable persons, but um, generally with males in society, you know, it often goes un, underreported, um, not reported at all. And we know that their rates are um, pretty comparable to women. They just don't speak on it because, you know, there's this, um, there's this kind of expectation of them in society, be a man, fight back, you know, like men don't get abused, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Is it, do we have what, sorry, do You're we right. have um, higher rate, like numbers here in America than most countries uh, on abuse of the elderly altogether? Um, definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, men in general, and again, that's, um, some of it is like we said before, cultural. Um, some of it is just the system, society, the way that we see elder abuse, the way we see abuse in general. Um, but in terms of men and women, for women it's about one in four, men it's about one in seven, um, and that again is just what's reported. So those numbers are pretty close to each other. Can you catch? Yeah, I can catch. Yeah? Okay. Just like, yeah, I can catch. Oh! <laughs> that was my bad. Really bad. He can catch <laughs> I'm sure he can catch. <laughs> Sir, I, yeah. uh, something that, it's somewhere along this line, but I think it's one of the biggest challenges we actually have mm -hmm. is because there's not enough communication with the families, the spouses, and then combined, there's not focus on advanced directives. Mm -hmm. And I've seen professionally so much so that when it comes closer to people's end of life options, they don't really know what they are. Right. And so consequently, because you're asking them in a family discussion, they pull out all the stops. I mean, this little factoid is about 30% of the total Medicare funds, which is mm -hmm. now close to a trillion dollars, almost $300 billion a year goes the last 30 days of life, oh. when that person was pretty much already dead. Yeah. And what you see happen to them often, particularly if they're in acute situations in intensive care units, is nothing short of torture. 
because right. we're just not educated around that. We have a very unhealthy perspective of death and understanding what death is, and even the morbidity that precedes death. Then, right. so there really needs to be conversations about you know with mom and dad or whomever it happens to be or grandparents, mm -hmm. um, so that they don't necessarily have to go through this, and it doesn't end up also creating tremendous financial hardship to the remaining right. spouse that survives. Members, yep. It's a big, big problem. Right. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Do you want another piece of chocolate? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> you can have it if you want to. It's not shameful. <laughs> All right. So um, another form of abuse, psychological or emotional. Um, again, this is a form of abuse that we see not just with older adults, but almost with everybody. It's, you know, pretty common that we see. Um, verbal attacks, belittles, name calling, um, constant criticism, they um, ridicule everything that they do, they never have anything nice to say. Um, act superior, treats them like a servant, I'm taking care of you, so you know, I am your authority figure. They ignore their wants, needs, desires, ex excessive jealousy, um, often seen in romantic relationships. Taking advantage of their confusion, so maybe if they have dementia, Alzheimer's, any of those things, then you know they take advantage of them and they say, oh, you just don't remember, you know, like oh, I I, I paid the bill or yeah, I paid you back that two hundred dollars that you gave me or something, you just don't remember things like that. Um, watches where they go, who they're with, and then kind of giving them the silent treatment. So um, the silent treatment. This is also where that. Um, self-neglect can come from. Um, so, you know, it kind of lowers, all of these things combined really lowers the person's self-esteem. Um, there's a lot of studies that show that um, in working with survivors, they say that any form of emotional or psychological abuse is absolutely the worst thing that they had to endure from their abuser, even after any sort of sexual assault, physical abuse, financial abuse, anything like that. So this is definitely really detrimental in any case. Um, some more rejection, using profanity against them. Um, humiliating them or intimidating them. Um, some of these really specific ones threatening to put them in a nursing home. If they don't comply, if you don't start doing X, Y, Z, I'm going to put you in a home and they're going to treat you a lot worse than I do. Um, divorce or not to divorce, commit suicide, maybe displaying weapons, casually leaving knives and guns around and stuff like that so they're really afraid of um, not complying with your wants and needs because you're you know, threatening them. Um, denying access to spiritual traditions or events, um, any traditions with their church or any sort of, um, especially their social groups, so kind of keeping them isolated from anything that they do to have any sort of a social life outside of the household. Um, ignoring their religious traditions, which can be really detrimental to a lot of people, preventing them from practicing these traditional ceremonies and events. <clears throat> so pretty much not allowing them to have any sort of autonomy at all. Um, sexual. So. Um, this is something, and we'll see it in um, the next slide too, a lot of people don't see it in elder um, adults, older adults. They think, you know, like, oh, they're too old to um, experience any sort of sexual assault or any sort of sexual abuse, anything like that. So a lot of this is overlooked. Um, making demeaning remarks about the intimate body parts, especially by caregivers. Um, looks or touches the elderly person sexually in ways that make them feel uncomfortable and they completely ignores their um, you know, they're, they're um, asking them to stop or saying no, anything like that. Um, let's see, taking advantage of their physical or mental illness to engage in sex or, sex or sexual acts, sexual contact that's forced, um, coerced nudity, forcing them to watch pornography on the TV or the computer, not letting them change it. They, you know, they can't move from the couch, so you're going to make them watch it. Um, not using protection from sexually transmitted infections. This is a really, really common one. Um, bruises around their breasts or their genital area. Um, so with these, um, a really big, um, a, a time that we see a lot of these really often is especially in those who have um, some sort of um, cognitive disability or Alzheimer's, some sort of confusion, dementia, anything like that. So for example, maybe if they have dementia, um, they might be coerced into thinking that they were having sex with their husband when in reality they were having sex with their brother-in-law or their caregiver or something like that. Those are things that we see a lot. It's just making them feel confused. <sighs> How are we doing, guys? Are we okay? Mm -hmm. oh, this is tough stuff. It's to be all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> in this country. Yeah, like there's already a lot of other. Yeah, it's sucky for a lot of other reasons, and now you learn about this. Right, yeah. All right, so can I get anybody to read one or both of these for me, please? Okay. Um, we'll take turns. You can read the second one. You just want chocolate, huh? Yeah. 
<laughs> the emergency room doctor looked at me and said I had four heads. I told her that I wanted her to do a um, gynecological exam on my client. I was worried that she might have been raped and the doctor said, why would anyone want to have sex with a nine-year-old? Nine the police oh. said that but the police said that thought she had been raped. It didn't count because she couldn't feel anything from the waist down due to paralysis. Yeah. 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 yeah, disgusting, right? Yeah, and these things, these are extremely invalidating. You know, that um, you think like, oh, because I'm old, I wasn't worthy of being raped or something like that because I have this disability, I, it must not have happened to me, I'm obviously thought of as lesser, things like that. So um, again, these are um, back to that societal thing, um, that it's a system, you know, Is that, this common that we kind of, um, I don't, I don't have statistics mm -hmm. on these kinds of things, but these are things that were actually said. Yeah, but yeah. It, so. this get said, you know. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, sure. like, Unfortunately, these things do happen yeah. in, in professionals mm -hmm. where we put our trust in as a community, right? An emergency room doctor, you put in trust that they are there for the health of the community, okay. anybody, including the community. And same for the police when it comes to safety. Yeah. And unfortunately, yeah. the worst things is when victims go and to get help mm -hmm. and then they get this right. from somebody that is deemed safe in our community to talk to or to, to, to supposed to you know protect you and things like that and it just it really reinforces that you know nobody cares about them i can't eat chocolate oh, can. <laughs> somebody take it oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> water <laughs> i can't give you water I yeah um, yeah thanks for sharing that these are um you and know they, and these professionals need constant training yeah constant training on this kind of stuff because they will forget about it they will say they never had training and they will blame it on that and they need constant training on it exactly oh, yeah their head needs re-examining what was that oh their head needs re-examining <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's all it's all about knowledge you know and the exposure that we get and everything just because you can't feel it you can yeah. see right you're so there's yeah. so many ways you still know what's going yeah. on there are human shocked. beings do yeah, yeah. I, that last one is particularly Me shocking. Too. I mean, the first one is, is shocking, of course, too. I mean, right. it's all awful, but that last one, I mean, that's still your body. Yeah, it and is. And someone's totally, I can't believe someone's that someone would think that's a valid, right? a valid excuse or that argument against like it. Like that's awful. Survivor, right, from your listening sessions that you guys do? Both of these are. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. So they do different listening, the coalition does different listening sections around the state of Nevada where victims, advocates, stuff like that, come and talk about things that they've experienced mm -hmm. so that the coalition can help whether it's legislative or stuff like that. So these are direct quotes from people that have experienced it. And I'm sure there's right. even more. That's and just like you said too, you know, when you hear these kinds of things, why would you go and seek help again? Yeah. But and yeah. that's not, I mean, is that something like a cop said? I mean, that doesn't sound like something that like a, the police would come to, right? Because if, someone, if you're raped on your body, they're not, it doesn't go by feel. Right, they're not saying, oh, well, you couldn't feel it, so it doesn't count. Like, right. It doesn't, you know what I mean? That just doesn't really make much sense altogether. And I, and I don't know that, again, I don't know that this was actually said to the victim. Um, this might have been something that was written in a report or something that was shared between coworkers or something like that. Um, but, yeah, we know that. You know, we know that rape is rape. Sexual assault well, yeah, is sexual assault. Any, but, there's like any, I don't yeah. think there's any place in America where the law says it you don't feel it, it doesn't count. You know what I mean? Like if you're right. paralyzed and people are sort of raving. Yeah, legitimate, right? Remember that, the politicians. Sir, yeah. I think it brings up a really big point. So that we're all in here, I think, relatively sensitive and probably have relatively high emotional IQs. One thing that happens is we all have an assumption that the person is very smart, is degree, is a professional, a physician, an attorney, a police officer, whomever it happens to be, um, that they wouldn't be perpetrators and they wouldn't have these types of traits, but they may very well have very low EQs. Exactly. It's been my experience that they yeah. often do. And so it's hard to wrap your head around because you're going, but that's not the way that they were educated. That's not the way they were trained in their own family right. or origin. And it's a really big issue. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something called the unhealed healer. 
Right. I mean, a lot of people go into that, you know, for tree. different reasons, but they may not have the emotional balance to be able to deal with an awful lot of this. And we look at it and go, you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is we just make these unwarranted assumptions that they're... But because we know, everybody else must that's know right. too. Yeah. That's right. And it's exactly. just not, unfortunately, the case. Right. Well, it's interesting, you know, you, you teach kids from a young age, to your point, Joe, that, you know, grow up to be these people. These are dignified people in our community, right? Which we think morally that tra transpires to, they'll always do the right thing if they have this amount of education, if they have this profession and stuff like that, but nobody ever tells you to be weary of that. Yeah, right. the power corrupts them. Until you find out yourself, exactly. yeah. Well, and, corruption. and going off that too, like you would assume that these people are educated enough, but the fact is, is like training isn't always available. Like it's, but Nevada is extremely rural. I'm from New Mexico, extremely rural. Like their training is, most of these towns don't even have like a police like right. station. They learn it's they like a volunteer them. like society kind of thing. Like they don't have an education or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So they just go based off of what their parents taught them and old yeah. teachings. So. It's unfortunate. Do you want some sour kids? Oh, I'm okay. Do so <laughs> you want to pass with you? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. But can you give them a little bit? Thank you. I was like, no, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Good comments, guys. This is a good discussion. Okay, so um, financial abuse. So financial abuse, um, you know, as advocates and people that have had exposure to this kind of thing, we know that this is huge in this population. Um, but for the most part, this is kind of one of those forms of abuse that's not commonly thought of, um, or maybe even thought of as abuse in general. Um, however, this is extremely common, happens in almost all cases of elder abuse. Um, the total cost in the United States annually for seniors experiencing annual abuse, or financial abuse, excuse me, is about 2.6 billion. Um, so it's extremely prevalent. Um, so some examples of it, giving the senior an allowance or not allowing them to have access to their own money. They have their own money, but you're telling them how much they can spend of that money. Um, because yeah, if you have like power of attorney or something, because if you have your card, you mm -hmm. go, or they just... How they might take advantage that? of that power of attorney, mm -hmm. so maybe, um, and that comes up a lot. So um, abuse, again, abuses the power of attorney, maybe mm -hmm. um, getting access to their credit cards, getting access to their titles, um, their mm -hmm. home, things like that. And then in that case, their name is on everything. So it's hard to classify it as abuse because, you know, how can you say that's abuse if that's their name on the home loan, I, you know? Is it a, abuse all these, like... I haven't watched TV for a while, but when I was watching TV a few years ago, there was like every other commercial during the day would be for like um, to sell your mortgage back to like some lender reverse to give you a loan. Yeah, reverse mortgages. And, and it seemed like there's like like a commercial with every other commercial for that. It's like it's got to be an epidemic as well. Like people being unsure. Yeah. I don't know if it's abuse, but I don't know. Just, you know. I'm not too sure about that one. Does anybody else have any insight, insight on that? It can be. Yeah. I just feel like, yeah, it's probably, I, I think, like, there's, they're probably taking advantage of it. They're very comfortable. Sure. Yes. They don't have family. Yeah. Scam Most financial yeah. advisors advise against doing reverse mortgages, right. but because it sounds so good, well, you yeah, start then you're going to end up yeah. out of your home, have a little few hundred thousand dollars that you get, and then. Yeah, they need to borrow off of that. Well, then right. they're, they're, that's the home is probably the most secure thing you have, I mean, right. I think, as an elderly person. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's just better to go get a home equity loan. You still own the home and you're getting some money if you need cash or whatever, but sometimes they work, but generally they don't work from what I understand. Good, I'm glad you brought that up. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, let's see. Uh, stories of yeah, destroy, thank you. Destroys or steals personal property, sentimental items, Medicare fraud, um, abuses power of attorney, send changes in their financial accounts. So they thought they had a lot more money than they actually did because somebody else was looking over their accounts. Um, altered wills or trusts, they allocate more money to them or more you know, financial gain to them because the other person might not have access to it. Um, running up debt, checks written as loans, gifts, cash, they have access to the checkbook, so they just kind of write everything off. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, when I was working with the elderly, I noticed that a lot of them, when they um, would get like phone calls, like scammers <coughs> and stuff, that was also a huge form of financial abuse because yeah. you know, they give all their information thinking, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a credit card or whatever, and then yeah. 
you know, so just comment. Or the, yeah, there's scams going around now where it's like, your grandson's in jail and you oh, can get yeah, their money for $5,000 over and, yeah. you know, you're worried about your family, I mean, and you yeah, do that and then you're out. There was just um, a case in Pahrump in Nevada, maybe it was Pahrump, but it was somewhere in Nevada where that exact thing happened. There was um, this woman, she didn't even have a grandson, oh. but she yeah. was kind of, you know, she had, um, her cognitive ability had diminished her dementia you know and everything and there was somebody calling her saying hey grandma I need money I need you to help me get out and everything and she was wiring all this money thousands and thousands of dollars to this grandson that she didn't even have yeah can I have a question on this like with money these days it's going more into internet banking and on all this online banking mm -hmm. so if you're 70 80 90 you may not be well versed in that right. so then it's easy to get <coughs> your um, power of attorney or your uh-huh what is it your son is helping you out yeah and you can't see it and if you're not mobile right you can't get to the bank so yeah and you, know, and you give that access to somebody else because you trust them to take care of it for you and they and don't the logins can get changed on right bank accounts you don't know, and all of a sudden, like, it's gone. Uh-huh. It, it's just, uh, it's crazy, too. It's, like, always, because like, I was thinking about, like, if people who are really wealthy, they're as prone to being victims, right? And they're probably not, I guess it's just, like, with everything else, like, the less money you have, probably the more chance there is people going to be taking advantage of you because you haven't been in one place and look out for you. Right. But, and there's also, I've read stuff about that being like a psychological thing too. There's theories of that when people are, you know, they're under this authority their whole lives and then they suddenly get the power, it's like they just go nuts mm -hmm. with it. You know, that's a great example. I'd, I'd also assert that the third bullet point there might be bigger than everything else financially in this country, the Medicare fraud. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the GAO, uh, uh, excuse me, the Office of Inspector General, they've been focusing on this for a long time. But all of you that have parents who are still alive, if they're, if they're using medical services, you really need to look at their Medicare account, you need to look at the bills, you need to look at the statements. Yeah. You need to make sure, even if you have to, going in when they're meeting with the doctors, because I'm not saying all of them, but all it takes is five or ten percent of the medical population, and you're looking at a big issue in terms of upcharging, trying to go to the next event that you can basically charge more. So instead of doing something down here, you basically <coughs> it's almost like upselling in the right. auto industry. Mm -hmm. And since you have to pay twenty percent of the Medicare liable of that, one, it has a cash impact but also really impacts the entire system in a very negative way. It's a really big issue, mm -hmm. and it's confusing enough, and there are, it's great, there's ombudsmen, people that can help you, you know, Social Security, a lot of people don't even know that. Call the Medicare lines and ask for a counselor to get clear, because it's very confusing and very complicated. Mm -hmm. And there's probably another 50 to $100 billion a year in this country. It's it's spent on that, yep. Yep. Thanks for sharing that. Big time. Okay, um, does somebody want to read this for me, please? Somebody who hasn't said anything yet. I want to hear your voice. Ready? <laughs> Pick on somebody. I'll read it. Okay. You want to read it? You want it? Okay. Consequences of financial abuse. She picked me up at the hospital. I said, I'll be so glad to get home. She said, you're not going home. I've moved you in with me. Do you want me to read the whole thing? Yeah, yeah. Over. <clears throat> you don't want to get close to another person and call them your friend. You're afraid of it. That's Mrs. Curry at age 90 who lost her home and furniture and had her bank account compromised by her good friend. Yeah, yeah so that was... Um, yeah, so this is somebody close to them. It was a friend. They kind of framed it as, you know, you just got out of the hospital. I'm going to move you in with me. I'm going to take care of you. And they took that as an opportunity to take advantage of them. So... What does that mean? You don't want to get close to another person and call them. Is that what the per the lady said? Yeah, yeah. Like, this is a follow up on this. The same person said that. Yeah. You're afraid of it. Once your friend rips yeah. you off. Yeah. Once your friend rips you off, I mean, it's not afraid. Right. Then exactly. you're afraid to make that connection again. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. That's her response. Yeah. Right. Yes. Oh, Sorry, okay. that was her follow up to what okay, she said. Okay, I got it. Okay, I thought yeah. this was like the same. I was like, wow. I thought she was like trying to play. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I probably should have had that as a continuum. Good catch, I'll change that one. <laughs> okay, so um, 
stocking. So I know we already um, kind of talked a little bit, or you guys already talked a little bit about stocking, stocking what it looks like. Um, so a pattern of unwanted contact with the purpose to threaten, harass, or cause fear in another individual. This happens for everybody, including older adults. Um, so oftentimes it can seem harmless. Um, sometimes to outsiders it seems harmless all the time, or it, stalking is really tough because it's hard, especially with law enforcement, to pinpoint the point where it gets dangerous, or um, sometimes it's a lot of the things that they do aren't even necessarily considered illegal, so this is something that can be really tough, so it's just a form of power and control over the other person. Um, older adults are almost as likely as younger people to be stalked, so that's Comparable numbers, women of age um, 55 and older more likely uh, than men of the same age to be stalked. Um, and most often the stalker, the stalker, excuse me, is someone um, that they know. Um, okay, so abuse of our older adults in the LGBT plus community. Um, so, you know, this community, the fact that they already kind of experience oppression um, due to their gender identity, their sexual orientation, any of those kinds of things. Um, they, you can add on homophobia to that, add transphobia to that, add any sort of additional oppression to that because they identify as part of this community. Um, so some examples, older man in nursing home is not allowed visitation by his male partner. Um, an older lesbian is not bathed by the in-home care worker because the worker does not want to touch a lesbian. And these are all real examples too um, that we've seen in Nevada. Um, a transgender older man is made to use the women's restroom and is referred to as she instead of he, um, the, the pronoun that he prefers to use. Um, so, and these things, we also see this a lot with law enforcement. Oftentimes, um, law enforcement, um, any sort of abuse that is of the same sex, they won't consider it abuse at all because they kind of have this, this um, you know, this thought in their mind that abuse can only happen between a male and a female, um, or male identifying and female identifying. Um, and this can be really hard too um, with, with members of that community. So they're often just kind of swept under the rug, which is a huge problem with them, and it goes underreported. So barriers for abuse LGBT seniors. Um, so historical trauma. So in addition to all of those things that we talked about earlier, all of those events that they lived through, through their, throughout their life, um, there's also a history of prejudice and discrimination against their community. Um, fear of retaliation by the abuser. Um, so a common one that um, might be used in this community is they threaten to out them. Um, they, in a, a person um, who is transgender, they might keep their hormones from them or something, um, not give them their medication that they need. Uh, loss of cultural LGBTQ community, so they don't have access to their social circles, and for people in this community, that can be huge for a lot of them, is, um, you know, talking to other members, having exposure to other members of those communities. Um, 21 states have sodomy laws that would require someone to admit to a crime in order to report abuse, which we know that's just illogical, you know, like, that's, that's the whole problem, is that it doesn't get admitted to, but, yeah. So that means if they get raped, and sodomized that they're it's a crime it is a crime but to be only, sodomized yes but the only way that they can classify that as a crime is if the person who assaulted the other person admits to the yeah crime. Wow. yeah Whoa. and that we know that just doesn't make sense you know that seems really backwards it is very backwards yeah I'm not sure what these 21 states are though Alabama <laughs> one of them I know for sure is yeah. one, I know that's a place where something is illegal. Right. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> um, okay, so another quote from um, an adult child. So somebody who was exposed to the abuse of their um, older parent. If I had only known the signs and symptoms and risks of IPV, I could have made that phone call that could have saved my mother years of emotional distress and financial abuse. So why do seniors stay? Um, this is huge reasons why they stay, barriers to them leaving. Um, and this is something that in our society, we kind of inadvertently ask a lot, is why do they stay, when instead the question should be, why does the abuser behave the way that they do? Why doesn't the abuser leave, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of something that's rooted in our society. Um, so uh, this is a real example. Um, 
So a history of having repeated inappropriate victim blaming responses from people who were close to them um, were all barriers to them leaving the abusive relationship. So for this first one, um, they went to their friends, um, told them about the abuse. The friends told them, why don't you just leave? You're stupid for staying with him. What did you do to deserve this? You must have done something. Mm. So after that, this person, they thought their friends were going to be no help. So instead, they went to um, their mom. And then uh, her mom told her, you made your own bed, now lie in it. Again, that victim blaming idea, you must have done something to deserve this. So after that, when she realized her mom, um, her friends were going to be very much help, she went to her pastor. Her pastor told her, you need to pray to be a better wife. Mm -hmm. Remember, never deny your husband. Mm -hmm. And an interesting one with the person who actually experienced all of this, with the pastor, um, the pastor had actually counseled her and her husband for six or seven months before all the abuse started happening, or while it was happening. And even still, she received this response from them. Um, and there's kind of this rooted belief that whatever sort of um, violence or abuse they're experiencing in their life, it's the least of their problems. You know, they have bigger fish to fry. They gotta worry about their health, they have to worry about their bills, maybe they're addicted to a certain substance, drug, anything like that, you know, getting abused, they, they can deal with it, it's fine, at least they have somebody taking care of them. Um, so all of these things, these are huge barriers to them leaving is because eventually they start to believe these things. Um, they learn to stay within the known or the familiar situation. Um, they, you know, they're with um, their child or their caregiver for years and years and years and that just kind of becomes routine for them. So they just, for the lack of a better term, they get used to it. Um, they perceive escape as impossible due to your fear for their life. Um, it's impossible for them to access safety. Um, their pets or their companion, their service animal, anything like that, we know those can also be barriers to people leaving is because they have nowhere for their pets to go. Um, how is it, do you guys have anything that you do with pets at TSI? Yeah, so our shelter is pet friendly. Oh, awesome. And um, if there's already another pet in there with another family, we can only do pets for like one family. Okay. If there's another one, we work with the Humane Society to board them until they can find. Awesome. Yeah, so that, that's great that yeah. they have these resources. A lot of places don't mm -hmm. have those resources, so that's just one added barrier to them leaving, um, you know, whatever situation that they're in. Um, some more reasons why they stay um, love, you know, whether it be a partner or their child or something like that. It's this unconditional um, love and affection for this person, so they'll, you know, care for them no matter what. A lack of alternatives, they have nowhere else to go. <clears throat> Economic dependence, this is the number one reason why they stay. They don't know how to handle their finances on their own. Um, they um, Maybe they don't have that sort of economic literacy that's required to leave and take care of themselves. Um, so on average, um, it usually takes about seven or eight times, seven to eight times for a person to leave an abusive relationship. Leaving the relationship is the most dangerous time for a person, um, kind of, you know, that's why the safety planning idea is so important and making sure that they can establish these resources before they feel comfortable enough to leave. Um, but for somebody with a disability or an older adult, it can take up to 12 times for them to be able to leave because they have those added needs that um, other people might not. Um, so what can be done to help? Does somebody want to read this for me, please? The most important thing was they never gave up on me. They never judged me for what I said. They were just really great. It helped me just to be there with them. It seems like whenever I need someone the most, there was a little knock at the door. Perfect. Yeah, so this is um, a really good um, example of the impact that an advocate um, or that any sort of support system can have on a person when they are experiencing an abusive relationship or when they are trying to build those resources to leave. It's just to listen to them, let them know that you're there, and let them know that you hear them. All right, screening, compassionate response, and safety planning. So who should you screen? Everybody. As we know from earlier, abuse does not discriminate. Um, it happens to everybody. Anybody can be a victim. Anybody can be a perpetrator. So everybody should be screened. <coughs> Um, how do you screen? So incorporating these standard questions into every screening and intake process. Um, so that kind of minimizes the stigma when you do it with every single person. And we tell healthcare providers this a lot too. Um, is sometimes it, some people can take offense to it. 
you know, when you ask them, like, um, are you feeling safe in your relationship? Is everything going okay at home? Things like that. They might think, like, why do I look like I'm being abused? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, does my partner look like somebody or my child look like somebody that would hurt me or something like that? So um, usually kind of coupling it with, um, I have a couple of questions for you. You know, we ask this of all of our patients or all of our clients or anything like that just so it kind of normalizes the process. Um, and if they require assistance for those more, those more vulnerable persons, um, providing an independent aid or an advocate, giving them privacy if they need it or if they want it for your organization to talk to them. Um, advise the survivor whether confidentiality or privilege uh, applies to your conversation. This is really important, especially when it comes to reporting. So um, let them know the reporting requirements for your agency or for your state before they talk to you. Um, sometimes reporting can be really, really dangerous for the person who is in um, an abusive situation, so letting them know ahead of time if you do disclose any sort of abuse or violence to me, I have to let the authorities know. Um, some sample screening questions. You guys, I won't read through all of them. You guys have them in your packets so you can see some of these um, if they aren't, which I'm sure they are included in the intake process already. Mm -hmm. Um, compassionate and informed, so some of this uh, survivor-centered informed trauma. Um, consider needs for transportation, access to mobility devices, any sort of thing like that with elders or vulnerable persons. Um, knowing their physical needs, such as access to medication, especially if they're staying in a shelter. Um, any food, if they need to rest when needed, sometimes they need a little bit more rest than others. Um, asking if they need glasses to see any printed materials or if you give them anything, if the font is too small, upping the font so that it's more um, accessible to them. Um, be prepared to house service animals. So um, some of this, you know, might not, do, doesn't apply to the TSA because you already do. But, um, and then having a list of certified, qualified uh, foreign language and ASL interpreters should they need it as well. So having your whole intake screening process, your shelter, et cetera, as accessible to any population. Um, safety plan. So a safety plan, you guys already kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, so there is some safety planning guidelines in your packet that you received, so you guys can look over those too. Um, but basically with safety planning, it's, import it's important to remember that no safety plan for any two uh, victims or survivors looks exactly the same. Um, it's really different all the time. It's constantly evolving based on the status of um, their relationship that they're in or their home or their caregiver, anything like that. Um, and the really important one here that I wanna emphasize is that it does not require a victim to leave. Um, so that's kind of that survivor-centered thing is we give them the empowerment to leave if they want to, but we also let them know that here's some safety planning um, and some you know resources just in case you need them if it's not safe for you to leave just yet. Um, just some risk factors for homicide and suicide. Um, so some things that you might see that might, them, might make them more um, prone to this kind of thing. Um, any abusing spouse has a controlling personality, availability of firearm. Um, the spouse is a caregiver, advanced older age, so especially at 85 or older. And that population, um, again, they're about three times more likely um, to uh, die from an abusive relationship because um, you know, again, they're older, their mental capacity sometimes starts to diminish a little bit. <clears throat> so if you, sometimes if you see some of these in an abuser or if you uh, notice these things from what they're telling you in the screening process, then these can be red flags for you. Um, some other risk factors. Um, consuming excessive amounts of drugs or alcohol, high levels of stress, um, risky sexual behaviors. Um, financial dependence on the elderly person, anything like that. So these are also all kind of red flags that you might see um, that put them at risk for not just homicide or suicide, but abuse in general. Um, <coughs> reviewing policies and procedures. So this is really important when it comes to actually working with an abuser if you're exposed to an abuser at all. Um, is always, you know, your safety is first. The safety of your organization is first. So if you know, you're coming into contact with, with this person and you think they might be really dangerous, they might have firearms, they might, um, you know, pose a danger to your organization just by being there, then know your policies and procedures of your organization before you proceed any further with them. Um, so these are in your packet, safety planning resources. You can visit these websites, look at these later. Um, this is just a quick bit on, um, reporting in the state of Nevada. 
Um, so we have an elder abuse reporting system. It's an online system. Um, mandated reporters are required to do it within three days of hearing or of suspecting the abuse. Um, let's see. Yeah, you guys can read through this one as well. Um, so in California, I understand you don't have elder prote protective services, you have adult protective services, yeah. correct? Okay. Let's see. Okay, so um, these are, I'm not completely familiar with the steps in California, but um, these are the steps in Nevada. Um, so investigate, they are required to investigate or submit a report to Elder Protective Services with um, the Aging and Disability Services Division within three working days of receiving the report. Um, complete a full evaluation and then all the report context, contents excuse me, are completely confidential. So what that looks like if somebody discloses who's um, elderly, I think it's over 65, correct? In Nevada? In Nevada? 60. 60 in Nevada. In California it's 65. Mm -hmm. Um, or a vulnerable population, you would log online and make a report and then they have three days to follow up with that is what they're legally mandated for. Right. Um, but as mandated, if you're a mandated reporter, you're legally, if somebody discloses to that, you have to report. Right. Thank you. Is that three business things? No, usually it's right away for mandated reporter. 24 hours is for CPS, I don't know about for Okay. What the time limit is once you find you have the disclosure that you file the report. It is three business days, generally. Um, that's for elder abuse. I'm not sure what it is for the others either. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was three working days that they have to follow up on. It. Yeah, the three working okay. days. Okay. Uh -huh. Um. All right. So this just defines who a mand mandated reporter is. Um, again. Um, in Nevada, it's 60 or older, you are required to report. California, 65 or older, required to report. Um, this is our list of mandated reporters. This is for Nevada. Um, again, it might differ in California. Um, in California, I understand volunteers are not mandated reporters. Correct. Okay. Um, so, yeah, follow what's told to you by your agency as far as reporting requirements. But and always morally report. Yes. You are a concerned citizen. Right. But. What do we know about reporting? What do you have to do before reporting? Anybody? Chocolate? Chocolate is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure it's consensual to report? Yes. Make sure the person knows before they disclose to you if you are going to report it. We haven't talked about being able to report Oh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably everyone's like, what? How teachers aren't out there? Um, so, is this, yeah, I was going to ask, is this specified for Men. elder adults? Yes. Okay. This is specific to elder teachers abuse. Teachers are, right? Yeah. Teachers are for yeah. child abuse. Child, child abuse. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I was going to ask the like, same thing. Right. Yeah. No, that was a good answer. Um, some other ones, government employees, mortuary, um, funeral home employees, social workers, et cetera, et cetera. Those financial institution employees, that's a recent law. Yeah. I saw a thing about... Uh, utility workers being in the position to find trafficking and reporting that oh. is that say for trafficking? Yeah. Interesting. I'm not sure about that one. It I, I was brought up in one human trafficking. Yeah. So it was a suggestion, which I thought was great because they're in the homes. Right. And they if they had the knowledge, they could be looking for stuff. But I don't know if they're on the mandated okay. reporting list yet. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Sorry, can I go back and ask about, um, so the mandated reporters, they have to tell the person before they report? Do they have to have that person's permission? No, or they, they just don't have, have to have let the them know. permission, but they should, it should be part of, especially for like these healthcare providers and stuff, okay. should let them know it's part of the screening process. Right. So I'm about to screen you for intimate partner violence, et cetera, et cetera, just so you know if you disclose anything to me, I do have to report it. Okay. And then you're kind of putting it in their hands. Okay. And sometimes they won't report it, for that reason, but you know, it's your kind of moral obligation to let them know that you have to. It's more, it's more victim centered in a way yeah. where like you're letting them choose <coughs> what happened. Like if you disclose, they know that you have to report. Which some people go there knowing that they have to report and that they're going to disclose. Right. And even if people are hesitant after it, you know, after they do disclose and you and you've already told them, it's always good to suggest to like make a report together too. Mm -hmm because it might ease it of the unknown of what's gonna happen. Yeah, and you can always kind of give them the freedom to do it on their own later on too, so you can say like, um, you know, if 
if they tell you no, just is it okay if I leave you with some resources just in case, or is it safe for you to, you know, have these resources if you suspect something, you know, then from there it's the victim center thing. You can let them contact their local advocacy program on their own if they choose to. Yeah. Do you want some chocolate? Oh no, thank you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's getting late. I need to keep you guys awake. Okay. Um. All right. And then the other thing, this is really new too, is a music therapist. Um, so this is something that we're kind of seeing a lot. Um, with older adults and with people with disabilities as music therapy um, as a form of um, self-care, mindfulness, care in general, things like that. And they're also now mandated reporters. So, mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Reporting process. So um, this is like what Andrea was saying earlier. So uh, they have to report it no later than 24 hours, but then that three-day investigation cycle comes into play. <clears throat> Um, any life-threatening elder abuse should be reported to law enforcement immediately. Um, so law enforcement and um, elder protective services or adult prote protective services, they handle them a little bit differently when you report it. Um, so with elder or adult protective services, they kind of handle it more on the quality of the evidence that they're given, and that tells them whether or not they should investigate it further, whereas law enforcement kind of takes um, the more beyond reasonable doubt approach so they kind of have more of the quantity of evidence that you have so sometimes you can choose which one you report to earlier for the most part it's adult or elder protective services and then they can report it to law enforcement later on should they see it fit um, but that's kind of the difference in evidence that they look for um, content of reports this is in your packet you guys can look through this um, where to report elder abuse in Nevada. So we have our Aging and Disability Services Division that handles um, elder abuse reports. All their information is there. And then in um, California, they have it. This is the main office here for Adult Protective Services, but they have different policies for each county. So um, this is Nevada County, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, you'll just have to know the requirements for your specific county. All right, so we are ready. So. Um, can we take a 10 to 15 minute break? Yeah, we'll go okay. ahead and take a um, quick 10 minute break. Um, use a bathroom, water, yeah, color, whatever you need to, stretch. Uh, I just want to give you guys a forewarning that this story about Miss Mary, who we're about to learn about, is pretty graphic. So if you guys are having a hard time with it, please feel free to exit out the room. Just give me a thumbs up. Know that you're okay. Then we can check in about it later, okay? Yeah, please do. Self-care is most important. So if there's anything that's especially triggering to you or, um, you know, it's this is really heavy stuff. So please do take care of yourself. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> Miss Mary, age 98, oh. had lived independently for some time before moving to a nursing home. Sometime later, she had the chance to leave that nursing home and move in with her grandson, Billy, and his wife, Susan. In this video, you will hear from Miss Mary, two sexual assault advocates, and several criminal justice professionals. Some of the footage in this video may be difficult to view as it contains graphic content and photographs of serious injuries. Emma, when he bring his check in, they blow it. They didn't have no money to pay a mortgage, $500 a month mortgage. And they said, Granny, you got any money? So I get my next check and I'll pay that. I let him have it. I gave him two $500 checks at one time. Did I say two at one time? And I said, now Bill, go pay that mortgage. And what changed? I said, bring it back. Come back to Lincoln. I never did see none. I never have seen none of my money. It sounded like pretty much from the start there was problems with that. Not only with her government check being misused, um, they would drive her to the bank, they would have her cash it, they would immediately, you know, go buy things, but not things for Mary. Mary would request, one of her favorite things is chocolate milk to this day, <laughs> she loves chocolate milk. Um, she would request that they would buy her chocolate milk at the grocery store and give her, they would, she would give them money. Those kind of requests were never you know, were never made. She would make her own food and make dinner for them, um, and they would just kind of come in haphazardly, um, not really appreciating or acknowledging anything that she was doing. Um, the fact that she's, you know, in her late 80s and 90s at this point when this was all going on, she was doing primarily the housework from what it sounds like, was doing the cooking for the family, 
um, was really taking care of them <laughs> instead of them taking care of her. I think she felt lucky in the sense that she did not want to be at a nursing home, so she felt like she was lucky to have her things and be kind of out in the real world. Um, and so she did whatever she could to make that family work, um, make that situation work. I had to get along best I could. And I didn't say nothing. Mary had told me that they had gone, she had gone on a regular basis to put some of her um, government check into a burial policy so that when she passed, everything would be taken care of. I, I, I was trying to say, well, it'll be a month, so I was paying on my film bill, you know, I, and I, I gave her money. I gave her money to go in there and pay it. And she go in there and she come back. I stayed in the truck. I said, did they give you a receipt? She said, no, they don't give a receipt. And, well, I went on. <clears throat> Next month come, I gave her some more money. And I said, did you give a receipt? She said, no, but I said, they didn't give no receipt in there. The third time, I gave her some money. She went and come too fast, too quick. She went and come right quick. I said, well, that was quick going and coming. She said, yes, yeah. there wasn't nobody there. She said, I just opened the door and walk in there and put the money on the desk and come on out. That's whenever I called her. But I didn't say nothing. I didn't say a word. This is certainly a situ situation where there was ongoing misuse of the elders money and assets and that was going on for a very long time typically in these cases what we find is that while the financial exploitation might become obvious if someone's really looking at it what's not obvious is that there will be power and control issues that come in as whoever's doing the exploitation seeks to gain more and more control over the elder's assets. And that's where you start seeing physical violence, sexual violence, things escalate, <coughs> as in domestic violence of all kinds. Family violence against elders is domestic violence, and the power and control issues are always there. And I want one Thompson. Here. Yeah, I talk out here. I'm hurt. Ma'am, you need police or rescue. Yeah, okay, I do a free call out here. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, do you have? Okay, you need to. Where's your address? <laughs> okay, listen to me, okay? Take a deep breath, okay? Who are you having a problem with? Who are you having a problem with? I don't know, but please, please. Okay, listen to me, ma'am. Who are you? Will you listen? Will you listen to me, please? You said it's a maniac in your house. Who's in your house? Well, he's in the house. He hurt me. I'm bleeding. Thank you, please. Please hurry. Please hurry. She was, had so many bruises on her. I hadn't seen anybody with that many bruises before. Um, all down her arms and legs. and um, her, She had gauze everywhere and there was, it was just, it was really hard to walk in there and to see her. You know, it was done at night. On a Sunday afternoon about six o'clock. And it went on to two o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, two o'clock Monday morning. It went on that long, and he was so drunk. And um, that's when he said, I'm going, I'm going to rub you down. He said, I'm going to rub you down tonight. And he just went to scrubbing on me, all over me. And I ran over that way. I said, don't, don't, Bill, quit. And he got worse and worse. He jerked me up. And he run. I, I tried to say something to put him off, you know. And so I said, there's somebody at the doorbell. And he jerked me up out of my chair. 
and he carried me to the door and said, of course there wasn't nobody at the door. And he grabbed me up, went and put me in on his bed <coughs> and laid me. He me back out and come to the back and then a half. Kept on dragging me around in there. I said, Bill, I gotta go to the bathroom. He, he wouldn't turn me loose. He wouldn't. He had kept hope of me. I said, I gotta go to the bathroom. So he um, opened the bathroom door and I went in the bathroom. He followed me in there, had a hold of me. And uh, I sat down. And he, I had to say this, but it's the truth. That's what y'all want, it's the truth. Yeah. He rubbed his finger all in my face. His penis, mm -hmm. he rubbed it all in my face. And um, I told him, I said, I said, I want to go back in that room. He yelled me back in the, in the room and I sat down. He shoved me down. He had to hold my hands. And he yelled me, from there, he yelled me out to the, the back door. Opened the back crash door. And I cut my hand, I just cut my hand on the door when they drove me through there. So, I'm here, here. 18 stitches and two, hey, it was two in my ankle. And he drove me out and I told him, he said, I, I'm gonna go into the little house, I got some beer out there. I, yeah, he said, I got two more beer. I said, well, you go get, go get the beer and I'll have you drink it. You know, I was just telling him that, you know, make him turn me loose. He said, no, I'm gonna carry you with me. So he jumped me out the back porch, down the door steps, barefoot, just had my night and clothes on, down to the little house, and back is driving me. He said, I'm gonna kill you anyhow. He said, I'm gonna kill you before daylight. Now he, he told me that, dragging it, dragging it, dragging it. I'm gonna kill you before daylight. Nobody won't know who done it. And I cut my knee off there on something out in the yard. It had grass and gravel all in it. And I uh, got back in the house. He slammed me down. And he took me his fingers and put them by my nose and twisted it around. And my face was black and blue. My hands was all cut up. And um, he said, well, it's time to go to bed. I said, well, you go in there and go to bed, Bill. And um, he said, no. He jumped me in my room. And he got in my bed. And um, he didn't have no clothes on. He told me to get up there in the bed with him. I said, I'm not getting up there. And he, um, he could lay down, put his back in my bed. He was, my bed was about like this. And um, so I was trying to find a way to get away from him. So he lay down. And I felt him when he yelled. And I rubbed my hand out from under him, for he had a hold of it. And I went in there and I called 911. I said, there are many acting in the house, and I said, he's just about killed me. I said, I'm bleeding to death. And uh, so they come out there and found him in my bed. And they got him up, put handcuffs on him, put him in the car. I, I'll never forget the day of that case at the office because earlier in the in the year, in the previous year, we had had a 60-some-year-old a, uh, victim assaulted by a family member and a 78 year old victim assaulted by her natural son. And in this business, when you work in, in these kind of specialty crimes of, of domestic violence and, and sexual abuse, <coughs> every day you think, uh, you know, that tops it, you'll never hear anything worse. And then this file comes in with Lisa of a 96 year old victim assaulted by her 38 or 37 year old grandson. I think that the exploitation was going on. Um, clearly there was emotional abuse going on where she was pretty much the servant and w her wishes were being ignored and there were expectations that she would basically work for Susan 
and I, I just see the situation escalating and escalating in pretty much a classic sort of sense. Now, all of a sudden, Billy rapes Mary. And it seems like something that came out of the blue. But when you start really digging into what else was going on, it's not quite so out of the blue. It's shocking in that it had a sexual aspect of it. But, uh, but not so shocking when you think of it as part of this whole package of exploitation and abuse, I think, that was going on. Adult Protective Services was made aware of Miss Mary's case. They substantiated the abuse and assisted in finding long-term care for Miss Mary. Pretty much right from the beginning, um, Mary wanted to see the photos that were taken of her, and it was a very important for her to not only see them, but she wanted a copy. That's where you. That's where. I can't kind of see the Yeah, I know, but he pulled you down these steps. Yeah, to this section. Down to this, okay. For Mary, it seemed more like a validation for her. I think the whole situation was so shocking. And that first week I saw her every day in the hospital, she was in pure shock that, that first week. And so for her, I think after time had gone by and looking at those pictures, just like, yes, this really happened to me. I'm not making this up. Um, especially because the family was so insistent that this didn't happen, that, that really helped her to realize that it, it did happen. We were very, very concerned that other family members would come in and dissuade her from testifying or convince her that it didn't really happen um, or, or that something like that would happen. So um, I think when you hear Ashley talk, she'll actually call uh, Miss Mary JD, and that's because we initially had her as a, a Jane Doe. Everyone at the nursing home refers to her as JD. Um, she has, excuse me, since she still is in the same place and um, obviously the security is, is, is lessened, but you know, when we still go by there, they still do ask that we sign in and make sure that they check where we're from and everything because there still are issues with some of her family members. The trial took eight days, which is incredibly long for this state where we have full discovery. It, it is very unusual for a criminal trial to take that kind of time, especially in light of the fact that there wa it wasn't a particularly big trial. There weren't a whole lot of witnesses, but as I mentioned before, uh, defense counsel was rather verbose. You know, going into the courtroom, it, it is divided on, on two sides, and you know, everyone that was pretty much against her was on one side, and then everyone that was for her was on the other side. Sadly, the people that were for, were for her were people that she had met after this had happened. It was, you know, her advocate, it was Nancy, it was people from our office that were there, that had an interest in the case, that believed her, that, that were there to show their support for her because it was so against her. What Cheyenne did and what <laughs> the you know attorneys who prosecute these cases often do for children and, and uh, aged victims um, is they move closer with consent of the court and move closer to them, providing just a, a little bit more maybe physical support by being closer. Well, the tactic of the defense attorney was just the opposite and moved farther away and it was, uh, it was excruciating to watch uh, and was probably 15 or 20 feet away from her, as Cheyenne said, with the apparent purpose of making her look incompetent um, and to demonstrate to the jury that she was not a good witness. Just because of, of the tactics that were used, how long it went on, we were very worried that the jury was going to let him go. And, and I think one of the things you have to understand in dealing with these types of cases more than anything is one of the greatest obstacles we come in contact with with a jury is the first thing you have to get them over is the concept that something like this could happen. Juries don't ever want to believe that sexual abuse happens, but put that aside, a grandson, on a grandmother, and that is a huge obstacle that you face. You start back in a case like this, not ra rather than on an even playing field. And the only thing that Cheyenne and I really could do was just from the outset explain to the jury again and again and again that that's not our job and that we can't give motive. We simply, we cannot tell you why he did this. We have no idea and you have to accept that that's something that we can't do. And you know, when you asked before, are we worried about the verdict? 
Well, when I spent 20 minutes in closing argument saying, we cannot tell you why he did this, and I say, see these blank stares coming back at me, of course, we're worried about the verdict. Miss Mary stayed in her nursing home until she passed away about three years later. Um, and the um, granddaughter-in-law, the wife of Billy, um, unfortunately was never caught. So she kind of fleed um, and then she escaped prosecution of any sort. Um, so was it the other ones. This one? Oh, just what? debrief questions really fast. What was that? Was that in Nevada? Right I don't know what state this was oh, in. Okay. No, yeah. Well, it said adult protective services, so this is not Right, California, so it right? might not have been. But number six, last one? Um, one of the last ones, go up a little bit. Keep going down. It's like one of the last 10 slides. So, um, what do you guys, what are your guys' general thoughts on this? Any was, initial reactions? Yeah. Was there a history of like physical and sexual abuse beyond that, or just them taking advantage of her financially and like making her like you know cook, cook for them and things like that, like take care of them? Because why were they after the wife? Is my question. Was she involved in like was, just because of negligence, or was she somehow she involved? Was stealing in, money. Yeah, she was involved in the financial. So about the money, right? Because he was. They prosecuted him on heavy criminal charges, both like what it was. Aggravated assault and what was the other one? So they didn't go after him for. So they didn't, you know what I mean? Like they were just gonna tack tack her in on those two charges, or? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, that I'm not sure of, but that's a that's a good question. Yeah, I really admired her strength and her. Voice. Yeah, she was a boss. Like the story sucks. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. But she really wanted it spoken, and she mm -hmm. wanted photos seen, and I was like. That's really cool that she was able to do that. So it, I'm guessing that the support she's received since then made it feel okay to speak out. So right. I, was, I was impressed with how she was able to speak about it and, and almost a matter of fact, you know, so she's coherent. able to be really coherent. Yeah. So when Especially for her age. Yeah. 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 yeah, she was on yeah. So like, she's not this feeble, incompetent lady who can't speak for herself right. at all. She's rare, though. That is, I bet most women her age probably are not that on point, you know. Yeah. I'm 98. You never yeah. know. Yeah. Like I know. I have my grandma. My, my dad's family, we lived to be late 90s too. Mm -hmm. And they're all my, my grandmother, she never lost her mind. So she's like, And that's, that's an assumption that we have too, that when you get to that age that they're not going to remember, they're not going to be able to recall their story oh, correctly yeah. and everything. And she, like you said, she knew exactly what had happened to her. And part of it might have been that validation piece. You know, she wanted to see these pictures so she could she could tell herself that this happened. Right, she, she's probably been questioning it herself. You know? Memory degrades no matter how. Well, she's like, wow, this is a really shocking thing that happened. I never would expect that, but I want to share my story so other people know that it can't happen. Yeah. Anybody yes, else? I guess uh, one part that just makes me shake my head was the dispatch. Yes. Mm -hmm. say, you know, but you can see why that happens because they right. want to know is it, is it domestic violence, you know, or is it somebody's broken in or whatever, but. You know, the person saying, look, he's going to kill me, he's a maniac, all the rest of that. And it's like, and I know, yeah, it's just, it just but shows you how impacted everything is, you know. Yeah, dispatch, the dispatch scene seemed a little alarming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, she approached it, but dispatch has their own ways of trying to get information out of people, too, but it's definitely not. I mean, I've heard of horror stories, too, of people calling dispatch and they're getting yelled at by dispatch when they're they're in an emergency situation right because they're frustrated they can't you know they have different priorities of like who is it where when did it happen where did it happen you know but mm -hmm. still yeah. kind of alarming and they i would have found that info from her phone or whatever like can you be like logging in and, and so it, 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 I don't it know depends what, like it takes a long time from a landline, yes. Mm -hmm. But if they're calling from a cell phone, it takes it would take a lot longer for them to try to locate. Right. Stuff. And this is definitely old, right? right. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I don't know if they had a lot. Yeah, you have to stay on the line. 
a certain amount of time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my mom was a dispatcher for a long time, mm -hmm. and they're taught to have that monotone. Mm -hmm. That's like, no, because they want to, yeah, it's supposed to be like a calming, like, relax, where are you, what are you doing, who are you with, right. how many Keep people are phone. there, are you current danger, but they're typing what do you time need, already, yeah, right? That's what yeah. I was you so hear usually they, they send, the time she was the yeah, usually they send dispatch out immediately once they get location, and then their job is to expand so that the, by, time, by the time dispatch gets there, they have more information, right. um, but it is, it's difficult, it's, I yeah. mean, because I would have thought that they, what does it matter who he is, but I guess, Sometimes, if it is a family member, they're going to respond differently or take right. different people. So, what, where, where are you at? Was the question that I was kind of like, well, like the same thing. I thought that there'd be an ID up on her screen or yeah. you could call from the landline. Yeah, that could have been. I don't know where they are in the house. Yeah, you have to wonder too, yeah. like what where the dispatch technology is back then, where as opposed right. to where it is now. I don't know how. Yeah. Shouldn't you ask specific well, questions? Like, you know. Vague questions, like you're saying, where are you at? Like, are you at home or are you outside? Are you in a room? Are you in a right? Are you, are you locked up safe somewhere? Right. Yeah. My my intuition would just think, you know, assess their safety and then send somebody out there yeah. as soon as possible, yeah. or do yeah. both simultaneously. I definitely, what as a kid, have a key show up for calling nine one one and hanging up. So right. we, that was like early '80s. So this, mm -hmm. they've had like that technology see where you're at for a long time for sure mm. okay so in the interest of time i'm mm. going to move on um, but this is great discussion guys um mm. thank you for participating and um sticking through that i know that's a really hard video to watch but um the reason we like showing it so much is because it shows a couple of different tactics that an abuser can have with an older adult and it also kind of shows the intersections of um, the different systems. So we have our social services and then we have the, um, you know, district attorney and law enforcement and everything. So we kind of see how they work together. Um, so I'm going to speed through these last slides just because they're all national resources and you guys have them in your packet. Um, and then um, we'll go over questions that you have at the very, very end. So now we're going to switch over to our traumatic brain injury presentation. So I'm going to hand out another hefty packet to you guys. <laughs> But don't be alarmed, most of the packet is just handouts, not the actual presentation. The actual presentation is much shorter. To go over some of the handouts that you have in here, um, we'll discuss these a little bit more throughout the presentation. So um, the first one for, um, we'll go over traumatic brain injury and what that means as a disability. Um, but the first handout that you have is the functions of the brain. So when your brain is functioning normally, um, <laughs> the kinds of things that it does in the different parts of the brain. Um, and then we have, um, a quick fact sheet on victimization of people with disabilities or with traumatic brain injury. Um, there are living with a brain injury, so from the survivor's um, point of view, what it's like to have a traumatic brain injury and the kinds of things that they experience on a daily basis. Um, and then the last couple of things that are in here are um, tip sheets. So um, tip sheets for the survivor and managing a TBI and then also um, on the service provider, so accommodations that you can provide and kinds of things that you might expect to see when working with somebody with a TBI. Is it okay if I refer to this as TBI from now on? Okay. Traumatic brain injury, you know, you say it so many times and it just takes up time. Um, so again, just like um, all the old presentations, grant acknowledgments prepared by Judy, just in case you forgot my name, my name is Sarah. Um, these are some of the object objectives. You can read through them in your packet, the things that we will talk about and that you um, are anticipated to know by the end of this presentation. So understanding the brain, the brain and trauma. Um, so what's the number, number one purpose of our brain? To keep you alive. Your brain runs every system in your body. That's its number one job is just to keep you alive, to keep everything working properly. So we know that when there is some sort of traumatic injury um, or some th sort of life-threatening experience, it kind of sends your brain into overload. Um, and then that's when you get your fight or flight response. Um, and sometimes your fight or flight response, you know, you're not really, it kind of shuts down all of those other systems, some of your organ systems. You're not really thinking properly because your body is only focused on keeping you alive. Um, and so if fight or flee, um, so that flight is not an option, then the next is to freeze, fold, or faint. And sometimes these kinds of things, um, if it's not fight or flight or anything, other things can be detrimental to the person depending on their level of brain capacity. 
Um, so trauma survivors, so those with TBI, um, as a result of their trauma, they might kind of see themselves as lesser. Um, so they might see themselves as dumb, stupid, cowardly. Um, and this can be in um, conjunction with their abuser telling them these things on a daily basis, that they're dumb, unworthy, stupid, cowardly, etc. <clears throat> Um, 88% of childhood victims and 75% of adult victims of sexual assault report, report moderate to high levels of paralysis for various reasons, whether that be from physical abuse, whether that be from a traumatic brain injury, they fell, they hit their head on something, concussion, etc. Um, and trauma survivors often repress or suppress reactions as a result of their TBI. Um, and therapy can help a little bit with that, and we'll learn a little bit about what that looks like and how you guys can provide services um, as providers, but definitely providing services to those with traumatic brain injury definitely looks different. So America's silent epidemic. Um, in terms of mental illness and in cognitive ability, um, traumatic brain injury is number three in prevalence um, throughout the nation and um, with the first two being the first one is depression and then the second one is um, any sort of intellectual disability um, and then traumatic brain injury is right after that but we don't really think about it as a disability if somebody gets a concussion um, or if they get hit in the head any sort of blunt trauma anything like that we don't think of it as a disability we might think of it as a short-term um, thing you know they'll they'll jump back into it they'll be just fine in a couple days and sometimes that's not the case <clears throat> Um, greater than 90% of all injuries secondary to IPV occur to the head, neck, or face region. Um, and um, of the 53 women living in a DV shelter, on average, the women experience, this is in a specific study, on average, women experience five brain injuries in the prior year and almost 30% um, experience 10 injuries the prior year. Um, so just some more statistics on um, prevalence, what that looks like. TBI is extremely common um, in these people, whether it be mild or severe, and we'll look at um, the symptoms of both of those. <clears throat> so intimate partner violence, um, kind of a different working definition, just because we're straying a little bit away from elder abuse now, since TBI can be um, in anybody. Um, so again, we want to revisit this definition as being a power um, or a pattern, excuse me, and a system of control and of abusive behaviors and everything. Um, so the reason why we want to emphasize it as a pattern of power and control is because, again, it's not just one behavior that classifies it as relationship abuse. Um, and we also refer to it as power and control um, because it's not necessarily with a romantic partner. It can be with anybody. Um, relationship abuse, so again, any sort of relationship can be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, culturally specific, and as we've said many times before in the past, it does not discriminate. It can happen to anybody. So traumatic brain injury, does somebody want to read this for me? Quickly. The most misunderstood, misdiagnosed, un underfunded public health problem on a nation's basis. Thank you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's again, and we kind of see this with intimate partner violence, domestic violence in general is a huge public health issue that's kind of swept under the rug. Um, and TBI, again, mental illness is huge in the United States right now, and it's kind of creeping up, getting higher and higher, and TBI is on that list, but we don't really, again, see it as a mental illness because it's kind of onset. You're not necessarily born with it. All right, so working definition for a traumatic brain injury. Um, a TBI is a blow or jolt to the head or a penetrating head injury um, from something, a knife, a bullet, something else, that disrupts the function of the brain. Um, the severity can range from mild to severe. So mild might be just a brief change in their mental status, consciousness, so that might be from a concussion. Um, they just kind of lose it for a little bit and then eventually they get back into it. Um, or severe, so this is a more extended period of unconsciousness or confusion, um, loss of memory, anything like that, and that's for extended periods of time. Um, so causes of brain injury that can come from violence, we see a lot of it in falling, um, whether maybe uh, being pushed down or um, dragged down or something like that, often resulting um, from any other sort of physical violence, a blow to the head with any sort of an object, pushed against a wall or any solid surface, a toilet, a countertop, anything like that. Um, being strangled, so maybe not being hit, but just any sort of trauma to your head and neck region in general. 
um, near drowning, punched in the face or head, smothering, um, shaking. So um, this adult shaken syndrome, kind of similar to babies, it happens in adults as well. Um, and then being shot in the face or head. Um, okay, so people who experience TBI often are much less likely to report um, and that can be as a result of their brain injury. Maybe they're not in the right state to report or they don't really know what their resources are. Maybe they're forgetful. They you know, experience more confusion um, as a result of further abuse from their um, abuser and from the TBI. Um, and they fail to seek services. They don't seek them out. Um, they rely on somebody else. So this again can make them more of a vulnerable person. Um, about 20% of those suffering from a TBI have an increased risk of death by suicide, higher number of attempts, um, clinically significant suicide ideation. Um, so that can be linked to other mental illnesses as a result of their TBI, depression, anxiety, things like that. <clears throat> um, and professionals often, this is a huge issue, especially when it comes to screening because they either don't recognize the signs of a traumatic brain injury, they kind of um, you know, brush off the confusion or the loss of memory as something different, maybe being older, maybe having another disability, um, or they don't know the referrals to make, they don't know how to help them, um, or they don't make the link between TBI and domestic violence at all. They think maybe they just fell, maybe it wasn't a result of um, a violent relationship or something like that. And as we talked about before, the societal thing, the system, a lack of knowledge often leads to a lack of intervention. If you don't know better, you can't do better. All right, so consequences of traumatic brain injury. Um, so physical consequences, um, pretty much a loss to any one of your senses. Um, taste, smell, hearing, if you're hit in the side of the head, constant ringing or buzzing in your ears. Um, visual difficulties, you might have sensitivity to bright lights, loud noises. Um, physical mobility, any sort of fatigue, they might have trouble sleeping, um, insomnia, um, slurred speech, decreased tolerance for um, uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, cognitive consequences, so it, sometimes it starts with a TBI and then it kind of leads to these other things. Um, short term or working memory, sometimes they can remember up to a certain point before the abuse or after a certain point of the abuse, but they are kind of fuzzy um, on what happened to them in general. Um, attention, difficulty multitasking, these are things that are important to keep note of because these are things that you might see in screening pr uh, protocols um, or intake processes when you talk to people. Um, concentration, easily distracted, um, they you know, can't really tell a story without interrupting themselves or um, you know, leading off another path or anything, they can't really stay on the same topic. Um, decreased verbal fluency or comprehension. They don't know how to describe what happened to them. Um, let's see, problem solving, um, slowed reaction time, um, talking to uh, um, survivors who have a TBI requires a lot of patience sometimes because it might take them extra time to tell the story about what happened to them um, or to recall a certain thing. Sometimes they might get frustrated because they can't remember, things like that. Um, so overall executive functioning after TBI, so um, these are kind of these soft skills that they have. Um, difficulty in planning and goal setting, they don't really have that part of their brain that allows them to do that kind of thing anymore or to really think long term at all. Um, difficulty being organized, being flexible, prioritizing their tasks, um, this can especially make it hard for them in the workplace to hold a job. Um, initiating or modifying their tasks, completing tasks as a whole. Um, and sometimes they can still, you know, they think of who they were before and everything and they kind of live out their day-to-day -day life the way that they normally would, but the function, their ability to operate like normal, it just isn't there, but they might not realize it. All right, so some um, behavioral problems that we might see after a TBI. Um, the most common are depression, tension, anxiety. Some of this comes um, as kind of a, a side effect of their TBI. Um, sometimes it comes as a complete result of their TBI. Um, profound sadness, loss of interest, especially in things that they originally enjoyed doing. They just don't know how to like it anymore. They don't remember what they enjoyed doing. Um, feeling worthless and helpless. 
increased risk taking. So um, having a TBI can lead to sexual risk taking. Um, they might be more likely to um, be addicted to drugs, alcohol, anything like that because they don't have the mental capacity to diminish um, these addictions from one another, what's safe, what's not. Um, decreased frustration tolerance, impaired judgment, aggressive behaviors, they might act out as a result um, of their TBI from frustration, um, change sexual drive, and overall change personality. So sometimes depending on how mild or severe their TBI is, they just become a completely different person altogether. So psychosocial problems after TBI, this is kind of referring to um, you know, them, their ability to live as a functioning member of society later on, have a job, go to school, have friends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, interpersonal difficulties, so keeping their friends, um, maintaining these romantic relationships, um, dependency issues maybe on others or on some sort of a substance. Um, intrapersonal difficulties, so a loss of self-esteem, a frustration with themselves, anxiety because they recognize that their personality has changed and they don't know what to do with it. Um, PTSD is a big thing with TBI, especially with sexual assault survivors. Um, profound sense of loss and then family issues. So these family issues can come often as a result of them experiencing this TBI and then kind of a, um, a 180 in their personality. Um, so some of the issues that can make um, a lot of these situations even more dangerous for them after having this TBI, um, ass assessing danger, understanding when they are in a dangerous situation and defending themselves. Um, so this can be um, in a relationship, this can be in a specific situation, it can be when they're exposed to some sort of a substance. Um, it can be that intrapersonal thing, so maybe they don't know how to, defend some, how to defend themselves because they have that onset anxiety, they have that lowered self-esteem, etc. So that can lead to a lack of defense. Um, deciding to stay or leave in a relationship, so safety planning can often look a lot different for people with a TBI um, because they have that diminished capacity to decide when it's safe for them to leave. Um, adapting to living in a shelter, it can be really hard. Um, a person with a traumatic brain injury being around other people who do not because you know a TBI is not something you can see you know so sometimes they they do require a little bit more patience talking to them um, a little bit more of an understanding for what they've experienced and sometimes uh, being with other people in a shelter just doesn't give them that um, financial dependence and ability to hold a job or go to school um, living independently so their abuser may be their caregiver so another barrier to them leaving caring for children, um, and then it is important to, um, do you guys have this in California? Okay, um, yeah, so that victims of crime compensation, so they can get compensated for their injuries and um, anything that they've kind of um, uh, taken on as a result of their abuse, this is something that's important as an advocate to look into with them. It's just called victims compensation in California. Oh, okay, got it. Um, so, this, I think, is a really good kind of illustration of what the brain of a person with a TBI can look like. Um, so some of us who maybe do not have a TBI, we look at this and this is even confusing for us. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of looks like it should be a map, it kind of looks like it should flow, but um, you know, you don't really know where it goes. There's all these different feelings on here, confusion way up here, but then there's also hope but then they're feeling a little bit of pain, maybe there's some denial, but then there's also some guilt and everything. So this kind of thing I always like to say is important to keep in mind when you're talking to victims um, with a traumatic brain injury because when they're retelling their story and when they're remembering their story, this is kind of what their brain looks like. So, you know, when they're switching back and forth and they're, you know, they're kind of have these evasive complaints and they're not really following anything, it's because they're kind of jumping from A to M to, B to Q to R, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so accessing non-IPV services. So just kind of some questions to ask yourself as an advocate um, and to consider when talking to somebody who has a TBI. Are they aware of related medical care and rehabilitation support services? Um, so as we mentioned before, this is something that they often don't know of a whole lot as a result of their TBI. 
Um, are their healthcare providers aware of IPV? Do they make that connection between IPV and the TBI? Um, do any of the abusers or providers, excuse me, communicate with the abuser? Do you guys provide better intervention services? No. You don't? Okay. Funding doesn't allow it. Oh, okay. Got it. Um, I think some of our programs in Vegas do. I'm not sure. Um, <coughs> Do you need? Do they need information in alternative formats? Um, so making that more accessible for them, the large prints, um, reading it to them, um, audio, anything like that, um, and then consider what they rely on the abuser for, whether it's financial, whether it's to help them get ready for their day, to feed them, anything like that. Um, all of this kind of plays a big part in safety planning too, so things to consider when you're working with them. Um, does the abuser stop them from accessing services? This is big sometimes. So sometimes, um, you know, receiving medical care as a result um, or needed for their TBI, sometimes not being able to access care isn't due to their TBI at all. It's just because their um, abuser won't allow them to access these services. Um, what assistive devices do they use? And then kind of accommodating your services to that. Do they need a wheelchair? Do they use a cane, hearing aids? Um, a smartphone, a timer, anything like that. If you need to um, record things for them using a voice recorder, sometimes that can help jog their memory. Do they have a service animal? Can they keep them safe? Um, and is it safe to keep, take notes or keep notepads by the phone? Um, so this is sometimes when we um, talk to survivors with a TBI. Um, we can advise them you know, to help with their memory, to write things down as they're doing it, or to take note of the accesses that, or the resources that they're accessing, things like that, but also making sure that it's safe for them to leave those notes around and to keep those notes just in case the abuser comes into contact with it. Um, so issues if the victim is leaving. Um, questions again to ask yourself, if they leave the abuser, does that mean that they're also going to lose their primary caregiver? So things to consider in, in terms of referring them to resources. Do they have a plan for alternative caregivers? Is there somebody else that can help them um, and provide them with a safe place to live or to take shelter? Um, are they able to live by themselves given their injury, given their circumstances? Um, do they have a plan for their service animal, any assistive devices? Is transportation an issue? Sometimes um, a TBI can be to the level that's so severe that you know they can't um, drive by themselves, they can't remember directions to, you know, get to certain places that they once did, things like that. Um, and is accessible housing an issue? Um, emergency bag. So um, you guys might have talked about this before. Sometimes in safety planning, um, we kind of recommend that um, at some point they try and like pack a bag just in case they're in a situation where they have to leave really fast. And then they have this bag that has everything in it, um, their medications, clothing, list of resources, their passport, birth certificate, social security card, things like that. Um, so in terms of people with a TBI, making sure that it has any backup assistive devices, and if it doesn't, where they can go to, re um, to replace them. Uh, spare batteries for these devices, instructions for use of technical equipment, especially if their caregiver isn't there to help them. Um, medications, again, phone numbers, any important documents, food supplies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when facing, we know, um, you know, from things that we've talked about tonight, maybe from past experiences that you've had, um, any exposure that they have to the criminal justice system or to law enforcement in general can be really hard because the way they handle things is a lot different. That might be based on policy, it might be based on their knowledge or lack thereof. Um, so they might face additional challenges having a traumatic brain injury. Um, so to somebody maybe who doesn't know that they have a TBI and they're working with them, they just look disorganized, they look confused, they look like they don't really know what's going on, which can be frustrating for the person who's working with them. Um, they don't know how to be patient with this kind of person. Um, they might um, label it as a different mental health disability. Um, so they don't have a TBI, but rather some sort of intellectual disability or cognitive impairment, something like that. Um, and all of this, the confusion, um, disorganization, lack of prioritization, those kinds of things can even result in them losing their child, losing custody, um, and being viewed as an unreliable witness. So um, if you don't really remember what happened to you, how can I trust what you're telling me? You know, and how do I know that this actually happened? So they're um, very quickly invalidated when they have this kind of disability. So making accommodations. 
Um, so how as a advocate, as a volunteer, you can work with these people and accommodate for them when you see that they have these additional needs. Um, so does somebody want to read this for me, please? Yes. During her shelter intake, Julia says that she has been living with her mother who threw her out after Julia went ballistic following a phone call from her husband. She left her husband a month ago after he almost killed her. He has been following her around and harassing her wherever she goes. She needs to find an apartment and a job but feels overwhelmed by the process of looking. Thank you. All right, so um, what things do you guys see in this example that um, could be indicative of a TBI? She's going ballistic. Going ballistic. Yeah. I heard something. Yeah. Almost killed her. Almost killed her, yeah. So maybe some PTSD from that. Anybody else? Overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the process. Exactly. Yeah, it's likely as a result of the, the trauma that she's experienced. Is, <coughs> you know, something that is, you know, could be difficult for a lot of people, might be a little bit more difficult for her because she has all of that math that we looked at earlier. She has all of these thoughts constantly that are running through her head that kind of stop her from doing these normal things. Anybody else want to add anything to this? Right. So some screening questions. Um, these things, maybe you suspect TBI. Um, you think something might have happened to cause their confusion or disorganization of thoughts, anything like that. So um, these are some things that can be included in the screening process to kind of assess that. Um, was your head or face ever hit? Was your head slammed into an object? Did you lose consciousness? Were you strangled, suffocated, shaken, anything like that? So if they say yes to any of these questions, then these are likely to raise some red flags for you to tell you that, okay, there might be a TBI here, and this might be what I'm seeing with this um, client or with this patient. Um, some other things. So, you know, we know with abuse, it's not always physical. Um, so maybe some side effects that might Prove or disprove a TBI? Um, are you experiencing any emotional changes, headaches, trouble sleeping? Um, did your abuser do these things more than once that might point to a more severe TBI if they have it? Um, did you seek med medical attention? What did they tell you? Um, it's important with a lot of these questions to note that um, if they say no to any of these things or the absence of any physical injuries or anything like that does not necessarily disprove a TBI. Um, so, you know, everybody's different just because, you know, they're not experiencing emotional changes or they weren't punched in the head by their partner or something like that. Um, that's not, it's important to remember that that's not immediately grounds to discredit a TBI. So um, sometimes it just requires uh, medical attention. It requires a medical screening or assessment or something like that to really make sure that that's what you're seeing. <coughs> All right, so um, really quickly, um, take about, you'll see in the handout um, that you have in your packet, it is, what's wrong? It's I think the third or fourth ones, accommodations for individuals and then tips for communicating with individuals. So the first one kind of looks like a screening tool and then the second one is just a list. Um, so take about a minute or two um, to read through those really fast. Um, talk about them with your neighbor, what you notice, um, things that you see as important. <coughs> what kinds of things are you going to see on here that kind of stand out to you? Yeah. Uh, keeping the environment quiet and maximizing the structure. Yeah. So why would you see that as important? Um, well, the structure kind of helps... Uh, people feel secure mm -hmm. and when their mental capacity is uh, unreliable the structure can help keep them on track and keep them feeling grounded basically and yeah and then quiet and noises bright lights kind of as you said like that can mm -hmm. be really a hypersensitive thing for them now so yeah um, getting startled and whatever else leading to a flashback or just extreme uncomfort right. where someone else might not really understand that. yeah so keeping your environment very kind of calm yeah and collected and not a whole lot of stimuli maybe 
um, talking to them in a private room or a quieter room away from other people. What else do we notice on this? A lot of writing things down. Mm -hmm. um, like you have it both in problems with memory and problems with planning and organizing. It's just a lot of step by step, like write it down, give them directions, make sure they see it because that memory is such an issue and so is the planning. Do you ever assist with writing things down? Like I've had, I've had a good concussion experience some of this stuff. So sometimes just the act of writing down is fatiguing yeah. enough. And, mm -hmm. and but then I, I had quite, I couldn't speak or something. I give me a notepad and then I could draw what went on. Okay. I couldn't actually speak it, which was really weird. Yeah. Because that part of my brain wasn't working. So yeah. I drew a picture. Like, yeah, that was like but that's a great accommodation, mm -hmm. finding what works for them <coughs> to recall their experience and everything and letting them use yeah. that. Yeah. When okay. you talk too much, it, you can't. My daughter's had a bunch of concussions and it's like right. hit overwhelmed. When she's hit overwhelmed, because she's had a ton of concussions recently, when she's hit overwhelmed, she starts slurring her, bo her words. So that's when we know it's time to like do nothing. Yeah. So if they start shutting down and, and change, that's enough, and it could be 10 minutes, you know. Right. So, and then come back a little bit later. Yeah, you know, and noticing that, too, is really important, too, yeah. kind of knowing when it starts to go south a little bit and when they start getting fuzzy and saying, okay, let's revisit this at a later time. Yeah. So what about um, the other one, tips for communicating with survivors? What, what kinds of things did you guys see here? Trying to stay without a Mm-hmm. So you have person. Yeah. I know the words in the bank. Oh, great. But letting them get it out mm -hmm. and think it all the way through is important. Yeah. I imagine else? listening more than talking. Be what was that? Be patient. Uh huh. Yeah. I. That's why I really like the second one. Um, trying to avoid filling in their blanks and everything. Um, I think it's it's kind of natural sometimes when you see somebody struggling for a word, you try and guess what they're trying to say. But with people with this kind of disability, this kind of injury, it's important to um, help them find it on their own. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Um, so some of the things that, again, recapping some of these things were already said, being patient, don't rush the process, giving lots of time for them to um, talk it through, giving them breaks if they need it so they don't become overwhelmed after a certain point of time, um, allowing extra time for them to get from place to place, so understanding you know, they might be late, they might take a little bit more time to get from one area to another, uh, keeping the environment quiet, like you said, um, so pretty calm. Um, minimizing other distractions, keeping the sessions s short with scheduled rest periods so they don't go into overload, um, letting them collect their thoughts and kind of you know, self-care for a little while, um, repeating instructions when needing, and then maximizing structure. So um, that maximizing structure comes from um, having them write everything down, you know, and uh, keeping a flow, keeping them on task and um, on the topic and everything, and if they start to stray away and everything, let them, but make sure that you kind of also bring it back to what you were talking about before. Um, so more focusing on main points, checking for their understanding, so making sure that they're understanding what they're telling you, um, and that you're all, they're also understanding what you're telling them, so there's a reciprocal thing there. Um, using interpreters when needed, so if they do need some extra accessibility, being aware of that. Uh, writing things down, making sure that they know their rights, outlining steps to accomplish their tasks, especially if they might have difficulty with those soft skills, outlining those things, um, and then assisting with communication. So if they have trouble writing, if they have trouble reaching out to others, making phone calls, um, making yourself available for that kind of thing. Um, so uh, these kinds of things can be used um, to, uh, we say, uh, we say that they're helpful in compensating for their lack of um, capacity, of their mental capacity, cognitive ability, because of their TBI. Um, so these are some things that can kind of help them regain those abilities from before and kind of get back on their track. Um, creating a memory notebook, so writing everything down, encouraging them to write things down if it is safe for them. Using daily planners and calendars. <coughs> um, using timers to remind them of ADLs, 
Um, so things that they need to do at certain times throughout the day, making sure that they're aware of those, whether it be by um, you reminding them or a timer so that they can learn to remember on their own. Um, keeping notepads by the phone, creating checklists, and then using labels on cabinets and other areas of the house. So um, that short-term memory, if they start to forget where they put things or forget where things are in the kitchen and everything, kind of helping them jog their memory in that way. Um, some more things, these um, may or may not apply to your specific organization, but um, posting shelter rules and schedules so that they're aware of that. Um, but also kind of being flexible with them based on what they remember and based on what they're able to do. Um, minimize anxiety with reassurance, education, structure. Um, support their efforts to self-determination. So um, that victim-centered model, that empowerment model. So making sure that they know that you're there to help them should they need it, but that you also kind of want them to learn on their own so that they have that feeling of empowerment that they might not have in their abusive relationship. <coughs> Um, providing several solutions to the problem. So this is really big with safety planning, um, giving them all of these options that they have, um, not just leaving the relationship or not just you know going to law enforcement or something like that, but allowing them to make these decisions on their own. Um, and being familiar with resources and services and making sure they know um, the implications and the limitations if there are any of their TBI so that they know what's going on there. All right, so really quick handouts for survivors. So the other things that you have in here, um, right behind these tips for service providers, you have one tips for improving your memory. And this is again more for the survivor to keep in mind. And then on the other side, tips for organizing your life strategies that work. Um, so take a minute to look through these. We, in the interest of time, won't share them, but um, it is important to look through them really fast. Um, I think this information is interesting in the way that people who experience trauma, whether it's a brain injury or not, could have these same things happen to them. <coughs> like trauma emotionally could stifle someone's brain function. Right. And so aside from a specific incident, mm -hmm. this is really good research for people who experience trauma of all kinds. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, too, because oftentimes when we hear traumatic brain injury, we often, or we immediately think something physical happened right. to them, you know, yeah. but yeah, you're right. It could be trauma from emotional abuse or really anything that could happen to them in the past. Well, yeah. All the things we've been talking about. Exactly. In the past, the violence and whatever other crisis. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, the next couple slides just kind of, again, outline um, some of our resources that are available to you guys as advocates and to survivors with TBI. <clears throat> Wait one second. Hang on. Yeah. Sorry. Did you know that those are the same number or is that the same as organization? Mm -hmm. The first two? Yeah. National Family and Brain Injury oh. Association. Yeah. I did not notice that. They're both as a VI, they're the same website too. Yeah. We're all just oh, okay. family helplines okay. part of the brain injury oh, association. Okay. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good catch in the end. Yeah. No, yeah, but that's that's a good catch in terms of the actual slide because that's a little bit confusing. Yeah. Cool. No, thank you. Um, some national Nevada resources on IPV and TBI. There's tons of resources, fact sheets, um, different screening tools like these ones, things like that. Um, that provide people f of any sort of direct service program um, resources on being able to serve people with TBI. So healthcare providers, law enforcement, advocates, um, any sort of social service, things like that. Um, resources and services might include evaluation, community-based rehab, transitional living, any sort of support groups, educational awareness, legal services, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, just some information on advocacy training, so resources. And these are included in your um, elder, abu elder abuse excuse me, presentation as well, um, online modules and stuff like that that are specific for advocates. 
Um, and then team of professionals. So sometimes it, it kind of takes an interprofessional effort um, to be able to intervene and to help somebody who um, has a TBI. So it's not just one person, it might include um, neurologists, therapists, um, any sort of rehab professional in addition to an advocate, a social worker, anything like that. Um, you kind of need a guild of all of these people to be able to provide the proper services for that person. Um, some good reads in case anybody is really interested in TBI and wanting to look more into it. Um, so what are the next steps? Um, you guys, I'm sure, will receive plenty of training um, or might have already on the intake and screening process for your organization, what it looks like specifically for TBI. Um, so just knowing these things and knowing the specific procedures for your organization is extremely important. And that is all I have. Um, so the last thing that um, I just wanted us to go over really quickly is the very, very last page in our packet um, is a poem. Um, written by somebody one year after experiencing the onset of their TBI. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting poem, especially to read in a group. So if I could get a volunteer to read this, and I will give you two pieces of candy. <laughs> Please, go for it. All right. Uh, one year after, uh, I would catch myself. Sometimes you don't catch yourself feeling so complete. My feelings are out there confirming themselves on paper. My hand shakes so tight reflecting, remembering, it tries to work to bring back memory. It's hard, I feel crazy, I'm letting myself. I asked my doctor, do I have, what is the name, he said, depression. Why am I up and down, depression, depression, depression. In the past week, I could really speak, have an intelligent conversation. Now my words sound muffled to me. I am lost. How long will it last? This sorrow so great, and who can I talk to? Alone in a crowded room, I'm not the person I once was, and yet I'm still here, I'm still breathing, and I don't know why. I'm proud of my kids, and I love them. They were wanted, and I have them. And I will be their mom, and love them, and be strong. At their weakest moment, I will carry them, and at my weakest moment, they carry me. Thank you. So general thoughts on this poem. Anything you guys notice? It's kind of like choppy, like yeah, a little bit. It's very jumbled, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Kind of outlines the different um, processes that they've gone through, going to a healthcare provider and hearing they have depression, also working to take care of their children given their injury, things like that. Um, so I think that this is something um, that I really wanted to leave you guys with just so you can um, kind of reflect on it throughout the rest of the evening and think about um, this is a pretty good indication of what a TBI looks like um, and though it is a poem I think that um, the fact that it's kind of written a little bit choppy and jumps around and it's a little bit jumbled and everything I think is a really good representation of what a TBI looks like. So. Um, Thank you guys for sticking with me. I'd yeah. like to make a comment real quick. That since we live in an area where everybody's active, skiing, cycling, mountain climbing, whatever, just be aware if, you get, if you're not unconscious, whether it's from a bike accident, ski accident, or whatever, and you go to the ER, um, it's a good idea to get an MRI instead of a CT. CT scans are effective 96% of the time. 4% of the, of the time, they miss the diagnosis, and if you have a minor bleed, it can become a major problem down the road. And usually, they, they because it's 96% effective, they guide you in that direction because of insurance and everything else, but just be aware of that. And a lot of people end up exiting a few weeks later because they missed the diagnosis, not uncommon. You can get to Reno for a day because the hospital is Ridiculous expense. Yeah. I believe it. It's also yeah. very tiny, so limited resources. Mm -hmm. Right. MRI is one way to go. That's good to know. Yeah, thank you, Joe. You're just. You usually have to push the doctor. <coughs> yeah. Because they, they usually, I've had them before. It's rare, so. The yeah, case managers always push back against them yeah. because that's not the protocol. It's like if the CT scan is negative, you're cool. And most of the time you are. 
but unless you're part of the three or four percent, then right. it's decidedly not cool. Uh -huh. and, and particularly one of the most common ones is what's called the contra coup subtural hematoma. So you're injured on the, you appear to be injured on the left side because you've got something going on, but actually the brain whips inside the skull and the major damage is on the opposite side. So contra coup is French for the other side. Real common, uh, what's his face, Lynn, Lynn Nielsen's wife, that's what she died from in her ski accident. And often they, they feel fine after the injury. It's like, I'm cool, I'm a little bit tired and everything's good. And so I, I don't know why more and more in the ER they don't just go the more aggressive route with it, but they, but they still don't. So. Yes, yes, yes. Wear your helmets, people. Yes, there you go. There was a death. Yeah, this weekend. Was there from not wearing a helmet? Accident. Oh, just an accident. Yeah. Up on the mountain. Any other questions, comments, Thank general you. outbursts? Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I know it's late and we kind of sped through this last one, but I would really hate to keep you guys later and you have to be here. And good news, I'm going to give everybody chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> You are a really good speaker. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, really that's true. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, thank you so much. Right? And let's get those evaluation forms back over. Can I enter